to Ted Harbert. Uh, Ted was a naval officer during World War II, and he ended up on the Missouri. Uh, it was at Tokyo Bay on VJ Day. Ted, nice to have you here. David, pleasure. Okay. Uh, Ted, tell me, where and when were you born? Born in Oakland, California, October 2nd, 1923, in the Fabiola Hospital, which burned down three days after I went home. <laughs> How do you spell that? F-A-B-I-O-L-A. Do you remember how did it burn down? Yeah. My mother said it was to fumigate the place after I was born, but I thought that was a joke <laughs> once I got old enough to understand what you were saying. Uh -huh. uh, and uh, what did your father do? What kind of he was uh, out of World War I uh, as a uh, second class seaman in the Navy. Uh, he became an insurance agent. And, uh, and when the Depression came, his firm went out of business, and for three days, my mother said we were part of the great army of the unemployed, and then he took over as head of the Edgar Brown and Sons Company, an insurance company in Oakland, California. Um, so did he talk much about his experience in World War II? He did, indeed. Uh, he and my uncle, my mother's I brother. World War I. World War I. Uh, because the great the flu epidemic of 1980-18 got him in its grips, and he was one of seven out of 48 young men in his, I guess it would be a platoon, uh, who, uh, or, uh, who survived. So it was a, that was at the, uh, oh boy, it was at a naval station in near Brooklyn in New York. My dad, or my mother's father, died of that, that flu epidemic in 1918. Where did, uh, uh, where did uh, your dad come from, or where did your uh, 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 Fine, but the family came from uh, uh, California on my father's side, uh, four generations, including his a mother who was one sixteenth Portuguese, and I've always thought I had some Portuguese in me, and the other part of the family on my mother's side came from Holland and from Ireland. My grandmother's maiden name was Noonan, Sarah Noonan, and uh, the father's name was Richard Berlin, B-E-R-L-I-N. So your mother, or your mother's maiden name was Nuna. Was My mother's maiden name was Berlin. Was Berlin. My grandmother's maiden name was Nuna, oh. from County Clare, oh. which I visited in 1991. The Irish hadn't made much of themselves by that time. Okay. Now they're fine. Now they're terrific. Uh, so now you say how many generations in California? That four. In, four in, in, in my father's, my father's name. My Edward Lee Harbert was my grandfather. Edward Donald Harbert was my great grandfather, and I don't know what the name of the great great grandfather was. And and where did he come from? The East Coast or something? Actually, like they came from first from the Texas area, and on one part of the family, and from Michigan, from the Harbert side of it, there was a golfer by the name of Chick Harbert yeah. from Michigan, who was my second cousin twice removed, whatever that means. <laughs> I have no idea. Uh, yeah. You can see it on the chart. I never, yeah. uh, and uh, what did your grandfather I was under do? the impression that he was a, um, that, oh, that he remember. ran liquor, <laughs> is what I, my impression was, that he was a bootlegger. And Gramp smoked a wonderful pipe and never seemed to go to work. So that, that <laughs> family rumor seemed to have some substance to it. And they all lived in the Oakland area? They all did. That's where they, they first came to California? Right. That side of the family. My mother's side of the family came from, uh, from Omaha, Nebraska and came to uh, California in uh, Thanksgiving time, 1915. And on Christmas Eve, 1915, my great-grandfather, my grandfather, died of a brain hemorrhage, stroke of a brain hemorrhage. And my, his three children, my mother, my Aunt Ethel, and my Uncle Dick,
promised my grandmother that things would be much better for her, that they would make sure that she always was comfortable. And boy, did they ever come through. They really did. Um, do you have any brothers and sisters? I have one sister, Pat, who's in the hospital in Las Vegas today, and I talked to her just a few minutes ago, and she's okay. Was she older or younger? Than younger. You? Two years and eight months. And uh, what did you, uh, do? What when you were a kid growing up, what did you do? What, uh, what did you do for entertainment? Did you play sports? Did you, uh, yeah. Um, and and we, where in Axiom Oak right. did you live? Right. First we lived at 1006 Underhills Road in Oakland, which is the end of the Key Route train line, which used to run down to the Mole, and you'd get on a ferry boat to go to San Francisco. And uh, that was at Trestle Blend and Underhills Road. And after, in 1934, we moved to Piedmont, California. A little better school system, perhaps, but rather a contained community of maybe 3,000 people at that time. Uh, with an excellent education system and very, very uh, wealthy uh, citizenry. Mr. Stanley Dollar of the Dollar Steamship Lines, uh, David Eugene, David Sweetland, who invented the Pure later, uh, and uh, Jean and Dean Witter, who had a little business of there that they invite Mr. Clinton to come speak to. Oh, okay. And, right. now, and uh, <laughs> these. Uh, it was uh, fascinating because we moved to Piedmont and then we took off for the summer of 1934 because there was a polio epidemic in the San Francisco Bay Area and a strike of the stevedores on the docks which limited the amount of fuel you could get for your car and the certain foodstuffs that came from other than the, my truck. And so we lived in Piedmont for the rest of my life as long as I stayed there uh, before I went to the Navy College. Um, so what, uh, what, grade, what grammar school did you go to? We went first to Crocker Highlands, two words. So, uh, Crocker was, of course, for the Crocker Bank, mm -hmm. and one of the uh, gentlemen who started the railroad business. And and that was, was that in Oakland? That was in Oakland. And then to uh, the Frank C. Havens School, H-A-V-E-N-S, in Piedmont. Uh, from, uh, that was before any middle schools, but from there to Piedmont Junior High and Piedmont High School. Piedmont High School was an extraordinary educational opportunity for the people who lived there. Many of the people of whom I've mentioned in the Parent Teachers Association created a fund. They went to Stanford and to Berkeley and to Santa Clara and hired teachers, paid them more than they could make at the university to come teach their children. We had uh, Mr. Weingarten was the head of the math department at Berkeley. Uh, Walter Wasman was the number two tenured professor in English at Stanford. Senior Kusakanki, the Spanish teacher, came from Santa Clara. And they all gave, were given almost lifetime contracts. I don't know what might have abridged that long term, but uh, I don't think anything ever really happened. It was a terrific school. You could get any college in the, I was asked to come to Dartmouth and to Yale and to Santa Clara and to Stanford. Did what? Hale? Did you? Did Hale Luff go to that? School? Hale Luff was in my class, right. absolutely. <laughs> and and your your fight song. They talk about eating uh, thistles. We are Piedmont's fighting clansmen, bold and bonny bunch. We eat thistles for our breakfast, granite for our lunch. <laughs> I still remember that. I can bet you do. <laughs> <laughs> um, what was the, the junior high that you went to? Piedmont Junior High. Piedmont. It was. All six grades uh, were, were close to each other in a lovely building, which I understand now has been increased in size. Did you play any uh, sports? I played uh, basketball, and uh, my uh, uh, high school fraternity colleagues insisted I go up to football because I could throw a football up to about 45 yards and hit you right in the ear. So I went out, and the as a freshman, and in the first week, end of the first week on Friday, they scrimmaged us against the varsity. And I got knocked cold. And I, when they put me on a bench and I came to, they said it was about 35 minutes, which is a frightening thing from this point of view. I went up to the uh, locker room and got all my gear, including those personal items, and put them on Coach Brick Johnson's desk. <laughs> and I have never lifted the ball since. <laughs> Um, did you, uh, what kind of classes 
did you like? Did you... I loved the English classes and the civics classes, they called them then, I guess they're American history. Uh, and math was just a, a simple thing. My father had won the, the uh, mathematics medal at Berkeley as a sophomore. And it just, unfortunately put most of it out in the insurance business into, into figuring out the horse races with the racing form every night. This little paper like that. And he'd bet horse races. I well, I don't understand that. <laughs> bets the races. <laughs> But there is a point there in that grammar school time that is pertinent to this. We would come starting in January of 1929, after the first of the year, the whole family would get in our Essex touring car and our Nash thing with the thermometer on the on the thing uh, up on the, the ornament on the hood, and we would drive first to to uh, San Luis Obispo. San Luis Obispo, where the first um, motel in the world was. It was in pink. Oh. And we would stay overnight there with two rooms, and then we would drive over the grade in toward Palm Springs, and we would stay at the Takwitz Vista Hotel, the last piece of building on the strip at that time, across the street and down a little bit from the Desert Inn, and considerably down the street, on the same side from from the El Mirador, where we used to swim for 50 cents a day. Uh -huh. And so we would stay there for most of the month of January. And my mother and the maid and my grandmother and the little friend from Omaha, Jesse Brown, would go over to the Navajo band of Coahuila Indians or something other than that, behind the Takwitz Vista, where they had this wooden shack. And in there were these wooden partitions, the ladies would put a bathing suit on and get in there and they would open this sluice gate and this warm mud would cover them. Well, one morning my father went over with us and the chap there was willing to sell him 10 acres adjacent to that piece of property for $100 an acre. That would be where it would be Spa Casino. Now, I've never been there, but I plan to go. And instead of that, he bought a plater, which is a lousy horse, named Oh My Gosh. And by Oh My Gosh, my golly, that damn horse never finished in the top five in a four-horse race. It's just, that's where the money went, instead of buying all the property where we could build on today, make a fortune day. <laughs> 1929. And we went there through... 32 until the depression got difficult and uh, so I've been coming to Palm Springs before 99 percent of the people who were here ever knew it existed. Yeah. Uh, did you remember seeing any movie stars anything around here when you came to those days? The, uh, the last year we were there my I think it was the first year perhaps of the Tennis club, Charlie Farrell's place. I think it was, David. I can't be sure of that. And so, by that time, my mother's brother, Richard E. Berlin, was executive vice president of the Hearst Corporation. And so, he came to visit us and stayed at the El Mirador. And yes, Kay Francis comes immediately to mind, uh, as does. Lupi Velez, so it shouldn't be a total loss. I think that's the way she said her name. Firebrand, dancer, lady, singer. I'm sure there were others there. I just don't remember. All my movie star experience came considerably later than that. So then, so it wasn't too bad, the Depression, until around 1932? 32, 33. Yeah, when they closed the banks. What do you remember about that? The, the, my father lost his job, and then three days later had another job, and stayed in Oakland. And I remember nothing cost anything then. David. Remember, 
you both are too young to know how cheap it was. I mean, we had a gas stove with two burners in it at 1006 Underhills Road and, and a firebox that had these lids that you took out with this spring type of thing and you would put a, a fire in there in the morning to heat the, or it was cold in Oakland, California, to heat the, the room. Fire. I mean, I'm like a live fire. Then at the bottom, you shook out this thing. I, I had my job to shake out those ashes every so often. And behind that was a thing called a cooler. Everybody, we had an ice box, and Donnie, I'll never forget Donnie, could take a 200 pound block of ice, which is like that, and these tong things, and he had a leather something on his shoulder, and he would take that thing over. And every time it hit his shoulder, I knew he was going to be incapacitated. We had that in the ice box, but this cooler, you put everything that didn't have to be very cold in, mm -hmm. and it had s wonderful screen on it and had airflow. A simple line. <laughs> uh, and, you know, it was wonderful. It was, it, it didn't, I mean, the, the streetcar, the, the key route train didn't come in after 10 o'clock at night, so you didn't get awakened by the screeching of the brakes. Did you ever go to, uh, uh, I guess there was baseball, Pacific Coast League? Was Pacific Coast League. League. Um, a friend of my father's owned the Oakland Oaks. Oh, gee, the name is there for just one second. And so when I got to grammar school, sixth or seventh grade, I was the pitcher on our Haven School team. So they brought the junior high team from Piedmont to play us one afternoon. And Mr. Oh, gee, short guy, nice guy, I don't think his name, brought Dario Lodajani, the third base person for the Oakland Oaks, up to give us all a tip on how we should play better. And so we did pretty well with this game. I can't remember if they won or lost, but we didn't get blown out by these fellows who were older than we. And at the end of the game, Brick Laws was the gentleman's name who owned the team. Brick Laws, L-A-W-S. And he brought Dario Loda Johnny over to talk to us. And he said, you, you fellas have a problem with this team. That guy that you've got pitching there, he's got much too good an arm to be a pitcher. You've got to put him at third base. I got the third base and the next guy I hit twice by batted balls and quit that just like I quit football. I mean, these, you know, what, a, what a pointless story, but that's the, exactly what happened. Boom! And these balls would skitter down at you. It was played on tarmac. Wait a minute. Grass oh, field right there. <laughs> Boom! And hit you on the knee. And I fell with that. I got out of there. That's when I took a call oh. for my 12th birthday. My mother, I got a set of Poppy Jones Woods, a driver, a brassy, and a spoon, and a 5.79 iron, and a Calamity Jane Bobby Jones putter, and a lovely leather bag, which I still have, all wrapped up in plastic, from Spaulding's on Harrison Street in Oakland and a dozen ugly duckling golf balls. They were golf balls that had triangles on them instead of dots. Oh, okay. And so part of that was that present for my 12th birthday was golf lessons from Mark Fry, one of the five Fry, F-R-Y-E, brothers of California, which were very much akin on this coast to the, the seven brothers an Italian name to tell me of Ternessas, the Ternessa brothers on the East Coast. And so Mark Fry, I would have, I didn't know till later, uh, 10 lessons cost $12.50. And after I'd had this lesson out at Oak Knoll, which became a naval hospital in World War II, uh, public golf course, which my mother would ride me out three mornings a week in a green cord car, and people would look at it and say, what the hell are the people coming out here? For? And, and then Mark Fry would go with one of those ball picker uppers and pick up the balls. Well, I thought that was unseemly for a professional. And so I asked him after a week or something, Mr. Fry, could I go pick up those balls? Oh, you know it. And I said, yeah, sure, if you want to. I've got, got this thing. So the next day, lesson, whatever it was, he said, how would you like to play a couple of holes? So we had our lesson of hitting balls, and then we would go play one, 
3 and 9, back toward the Papa. I would learn more about how to play golf, playing three holes with that guy than I would ever in 50 lessons. It was terrific. He was a great guy. And then I played against his son, who went to Alameda High School, on the golf team of the Alameda County Athletic League in the 1939, 40, and 41 teams. So did you play on uh, your high school I golf did. team? Just two years. I wasn't good enough to make it as a sophomore. Uh -huh. But I was never the number one player. I don't know, number four or something like that. Did you get to play, uh, ever get to play Pebble Beach when you were living up there? The first time I played Pebble Beach was when I was 13 and a half at the summer because great friends of my grandmother's, the Samples, as in Sample, as in Dick and Bob Sample, were caretakers of a sort at what was then called the Pebble Beach Lodge. It wasn't really a lodge, it was just a great big farm, like so a Del barn Del building. Monte didn't have, have Well, yeah, Del Monte did. Del Monte had a Del Monte Hotel, fancy, but these guys oh. were at the Pebble Beach Lodge. And so I played there, well, I've played a hundred times since, but boy, <laughs> those early days were just a few and far between. Unbelievable. No, it wasn't like that. And then, the great thing, when I played next, after the war, when Martin and I were married, I would go out in the afternoon, it cost 250 to play on a weekday afternoon at Pebble Beach, and we'd go up there for a little three or four day holiday every now and then with all the children we had. And I think I insinuated into her stream of consciousness that a lady, a woman, a young woman, golf experience should be to pick up the other ball. I always play three balls, playing by myself. One, one there, hopefully one there, hopefully one there. And I said, well, could you go get that? And she did that for two or three years until she found somebody said, what the hell are you doing running around the golf course? <laughs> wasn't a pleasant thing to do, but it worked. Yeah. And um, what was your first automobile that you had yourself? And when? That I had myself, I was given on three weeks before my graduation, on approximately May 15, 1941, a yellow Super 8 Packard with wheels in the fenders, a black trunk on a trunk thing in the back, and a black top, and two spotlights, and green, which we call, pardon me folks, sex lights, inside that you could turn on inside the car, which illuminated the, for a map or something. I was given that by my uncle, it had been his, he didn't marry till he was 44 in 1939, and it had been his wife's uh, car that had gone about four or 5,000 miles when I got it, came on a freighter around the, through the Panama Canal to the San Francisco docks. Mm -hmm. right. What a it, car. How long did you get that car? From 1941 until just about when I went into the service because actually I needed the money to buy an engagement ring. That's why I sold it. My sister was here. I was supposed to get that. I yes, said, well, it's gone now. It's hard. 19, yeah, early 44, late 43. Okay, what were you doing on December 7th, 1941? I was studying for my astronomy final up at the, uh, near the cyclotron at Berkeley uh, for Monday morning, the 8th, uh, and Marna... Okay, you now, you graduated from high school in, in, in 41. June 41. So you had started college then? I had started college. I had gone to Stanford. I had been accepted at Stanford and was down at in Encina. Well, I was just about to move into Encina Hall, which is the freshman dormitory at Stanford in those days. But it still exists to some degree today. When I had a telephone call, when I called home, my mother said, call your father. And I did so, and he was with my uncle, evidently in Washington. And they got on the phone and said, go up to Berkeley. Where are you? And I said, in, in Aunt Jemima's, which is an eating place in Palo Alto. At Aunt Jemima's. Go up to Berkeley. We've already been through that, I said, and fought for the four months that I want to go to Stanford. Well, 
we're going to be in this goddamn war, so you better get up to Berkeley because there's a place for you in the Naval ROTC. He, as will visit us downstream five minutes or so in this discussion, he, being a publisher and, and now the number two guy at the Hearst Corporation, knew Frank Knox, who was a publisher out of Indiana or Michigan or someplace, and was then Secretary of the Navy. And he had spoken to Frank Knox, Knox about getting his nephew. He was not married. Had, oh, he was married, but he had just a daughter, two daughters by 1944. Uh, and uh, like to, uh, 1941, like to get him in the Naval ROTC. So sure enough, I went up to Berkeley, and I had fairly decent grades out of school, so uh, I had been accepted to Berkeley immediately, which couldn't be unaccepted at Berkeley in those days. Um, and sure enough, got in the RO, Naval ROTC. And uh, we used to have to, on Thursday mornings, we wore our blue uniform and a white midshipman's hat and had fake guns, pieces of wood carved like a gun, and we would, up on the women's athletic field at Berkeley, we would uh, march and learn how to march. Okay, so at this time, uh, had you thought much about a war coming on? I mean, like Knox and, and like uh, your uncle and your dad? We, my, uh, my family in, in, in supper times and what have you, was very politically oriented, so yes, we sure as heck did. And we also had a wonderful, majestic radio that had a funny thing on the back of it that you could take two copper wires off from this over here. One went up to over there and went knocked off something, and one went back to the library and we could get shortwave broadcasts on another, on the second band of this majestic radio. We used to listen to Hitler in the early mornings. And then someone would, I guess, the local announcer or something would in, in, in some way translate approximately what was being said, or maybe they did that from England. Yeah, sure, and see friends who were older than we, the draft had already started, were getting picked off. Those guys had been so silly as to take the money and go work at the, as I, as I did for two summers in the shipyards in Oakland, either in Alameda or out of Richmond, whether it be the Kaiser shipyards, Kaiser shipyards or General General Engineering shipyard in Alameda, where I also work. So that we was in the summertime when you go to In the summertime, school? yeah. I worked from, uh, I worked from April 1942 until September 1942. What did you do in the shipyards? I had a, a, a no talent job. I had I could <coughs> swing a golf club, so they gave me a 20 pound sledge to thing, and I was called. It, they called them burners. What they did, they took this acetylene torch and heated a bump in a deck to almost red hot, and then I would smack it down so it wouldn't have a lump. And then the bad job was to get, have to go down through a hole in the deck and down to where they were going to do that and hold it up. That was the bad, and I got lost down there one Friday afternoon. I can remember it exactly as I'm looking at your way. I know exactly where I was stuck and why, where I was pounding on the top with this cleat until somebody was smart enough to tap that, and I went back because it's completely dark. Tortured. Flashlight, you know. it was an awful half hour. You know, there, and I, I don't remember whether I chickened out and didn't go back there. No, I went back. Probably should. Quit football and baseball. I think that would have been a good reason. To <laughs> yeah, damn good reason. Exactly. Boy. Did um, uh, I got paid? I made eighty-seven dollars a week. More money than I ever seen in my life. I would work one and a half shifts to do that because, and then of course I had, I, I had to have a, a good, uh, a, a good uh, a friend who was the assistant general manager out of the Kaiser shipyards in Richmond where I worked first. I still had that fancy car, 
and I would park that out there, and people would just gales of laughter. <laughs> what is that? And it was awful. So finally, my father had a Ford V8 black convertible. And so I said, how would you like to use the yellow car? And I'll take that as a made that trade. <laughs> did, you, uh, did you have any other jobs when you were a kid? Paper routes, things like that? In, uh, in, in 1940, uh, I came to Los Angeles. As I said, my uncle was in the magazine business, and they had a uh, magazine uh, selling business that was door to door, selling subscriptions. Oh. And I did that and almost starved to death. Probably would have been in better shape if I had kept at that. And I just, I, 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 was, I thought I was very winning, and I talked to these ladies and uh, thing, but selling uh, stuff, God, I really wasn't very good at that. And that so, that's a tough job. I sold, one summer, I sold colleges and encyclopedias door to door. Boy. <laughs> And that's a big ticket. I was talking about some guy coming by once a week or once a month to get a dollar twenty-eight or something. You know, you think that'd be an instant sale. And then once, of course, down in near San Diego, almost in La Jolla, I was doing this, and this lady of some heroic dimension was good enough to invite me in. It was hot that day. It was like a coke or something. And I was in there having a cheap. And her husband came home, and the implication was that there was something other than the coke involved, and there wasn't. So I got out there and lost, forgot all my sample magazines. I was afraid to get. I don't know what he did. He was off. And I knew he was anti-Catholic right away. I could tell. Whether he was or not. I had that then in 1941, in my fancy yellow car. I drove to Hollywood with my grandmother and stayed at Mother Brown's house, their friend from Omaha, and worked at MGM as a uh, as an office boy in the publicity department. And uh, in the middle of that summer, uh, Judy Garland ran away with a guy named David Rose down to the La Quinta Hotel. And so Benny Thaw, the head of talent at MGM, called Howard Strickling and said, doesn't that kid with the big yellow car know Judy Garland and Howard who stuttered, stuttered, stuttered a little bit, said, yeah, but I probably did. And we'll send her down to the, to the Lakina Hotel and bring her back. He's down, she's down there with David Rose. And so my boss, bosses, everybody was boss, uh, got me into Howard's office and told me where, where I didn't know where the hell it was, because I knew where Palm Springs was, but not from Los Angeles, I knew where it was from from the Levining Gray. And so I went down there, finally found it in the mid-afternoon, and I went out to the one pool they had then. And Miss Garland saw me coming and she gave me this wave off. And so I waited around for a minute till David Rose with a huge smear of white something on his nose, white something that protects it, white, dove in the pool. See, what the hell are you doing? I said, they told me to come get you, you know, you know full well what I'm doing here. She said, I'm not going back. Teddy, get your ass out of here. I said, well, I'm going to stay until you're ready to go back. So an hour or something. She said, okay, I'll go back Monday morning. I'll be there at 8 o'clock this morning. And so I went telephone collect. Yeah, the phone collect in those days was down here. They had one operator in all of the desert, I'm sure. So I called Mr. Strickling and said, should be big. And I said, I don't trust her, should I? And he said, well, we talked to her mother and she's going to go down to the better back. So though, if you had a car, you did all these better jobs, like taking a script over to, over to, uh, over to Lana Turner's house, over to, over to Greta Garbo's house and have the servant close the door on your foot. I didn't even try to put my foot in the door. I just was standing there. This is for Miss Garbo, and this foreign-speaking person went, bam, and I had on blue canvas tennis shoes. So it's still I have sympathetic pain in that right foot right now. That's craziness. And and Jean Harlow, who often would, well, be 
more than than any polite friendliness should uh, should indicate when you would take a, 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 a newspaper reporter or somebody in there to uh, see her. Then she'd close the door. And everybody is blame me for putting some guy in there with her, but she wouldn't come out. I know that doesn't make any sense, but these were funny days in the 40s and 41s because these people were just taking, I mean, she was being paid $3,500 a week for 39 weeks a year. Then she'd go on layoff, which was in the each contract versus uh, deal. And then they would go to these wild things and try to get loan outs to work at RKO or someplace else. So occasionally I would just be sent to be a spy and find out where they were going, park up near their house. And then they found that that big yellow car with the black trunk that wasn't a very good stake out type of car. <laughs> that cost that great job. <laughs> now, you were, you, was it your uncle you were working for again, did you say? No, he got you a, he got me a job. And he had, he had these people like Luella Parsons and Harrison Carroll and all these various writers, and she knew all the heads of publicity at Fox and Metro and Universal. And, and, and so, I, I forget, who, who, who did you, who were you working for there? A guy named Howard Strickling, S-T-R-I-C-K-L-I-N-G, who was really Clark Gable's best friend, and Mr. Mayor's amanuensis, his L.B. Mayor, and Howard Strickling, who was his very high-priced gopher type guy. I a V16 Cadillac converted by my bank. I raced it once to, he loaned it to Tommy Breen. There was a guy who was the censor of Hollywood, Joe Breen, the Breen office they called it. And his, one of his sons, Tommy Breen, kind of a wild, good looking ex-Marine guy. And so he loaned that car, so he and I raced from Santa Monica to Santa Barbara one Saturday night. And the idea was, Whoever got there first got to have Benita Granville ride back with them. Now that doesn't make any sense to the normal perceiver of, of this conversation, but that was a big deal. Benita Granville was a movie actress, a young movie actress of um, some dimension in those days, I guess. Later married Jack Rather, who did all the Lassie shows. Who won? Mm -hmm. Who won? I was afraid to drive anything. Oh, no, no, the per person riding with me said the grunion are running. And grunions are little fish that come in on the tide in the sand, I guess, and we'd go with this net, no, no, a sieve, like you'd use in a kitchen, a sieve, and get these things up and put them in this bucket, so we'd lost. We got a lot of grunion, and then <laughs> Mr. Somebody, gentleman who we saw in Santa Barbara, or on the seat Fried him up for us for breakfast. Good. Oh. Well, I haven't thought of that for <laughs> 25 years. Sorry to get off the Our way. kids, when we took them down to Newport, they would, it was a way that you would, they would trick other kids. They'd run you in a ring. They really yeah. weren't running, so they'd give them those things to yeah. catch them and yeah. then take off, you know, and leave them there. And they'd, they'd be all night long waiting for the grunion. And the never showed them. That's a much better system. I should need it then to help you. <laughs> okay. Uh, back to December 7th. And so Marna was typing a paper for me, she says, and I was in working on my astronomy. And uh, now Marna at this time was. Was my was girlfriend. Had we become engaged? No. Not quite. And uh, no, no, we had not become engaged. We were 17 years old. No. Uh, and my mother came and up had, from down. Had Marna gone to uh, Piedmont? Piedmont High. My mother came up from downstairs and said, you poor darling. And I wasn't quite sure what that meant if somebody had blown a whistle on me, something I'd done that I'd forgotten to fess up to. And I remember how the conversation went. Then she said, you better turn on your radio. I had a little teeny Guilford radio about that day. And on and all the stations were on about, the, about Pearl Harbor. So, later that day, early evening, December, obviously not daylight 
savings time became dark early. Four of us in the Naval ROTC put on our white, uh, white uh, midshipman's type of insignia cap, Navy cap, and a white sweater or white shirt, whatever you had, and went down into Oakland in my car to help direct traffic because they turned out all the lights and the stop signs down on Broadway, which went down to where the trains went through at first in Broadway and also went to the to the uh, uh, to the tunnel that went to Alameda. Now by the estuary, and they expected, as you could guess, uh, the worst uh, possible thing that was going to happen that night or the next morning in the San Francisco Bay Area. So we went down and, uh, and directed traffic. I can't remember much about it. The people were very cooperative and good. Did you have any uh, Japanese uh, kids in your class? In we had none at Piedmont High School. And you, you, you really didn't know any Japanese? I knew or? one uh, Japanese. Well, Marna's dear friend, Betty McCann, mother, they had on that Friday afternoon on December 5th, uh, a, uh, some girl came back from a private school, Miss Madera's in Virginia. Two girls, Nancy Witter, Mr. Witter's daughter, and Nancy Miller. And they had this little coming home party for them. And so Mrs. McCann went out on December 5th and gave Yoshi an extra 10 bucks or something. I know it's here this is to buy your children some nice presents. I know Christmas is coming and what have you. And he looked at her and said, no thanks. By Sunday, you working for me. Marna didn't tell me about that because Mrs. McCann came in and told all the girls, "Isn't that crazy?" It made great sense uh, by <laughs> ten o'clock on on December seventh. Or it was December fifth. You're talking about. Yeah, December fifth. By Sunday, you work for me. And he took off in his car. They were Japanese were all the great gardeners around Piedmont. I mean, really terrific gardeners. We had one. And Marna told me that on um, on Wednesday, and so I called Dick Carrington, who was then the publisher of the Hearst paper in Oakland, called the Post Enquirer, and told him about this. He said, "Get the guy's name, Yoshi." I said, "We'll get the rest of the name." So I called Ms. McCann, and I guess she told me, and I guess I told him. Hmm. But, but down in Japanese town on the night of December 7th. It was fantastic. Skyrockets and firecrackers and everything. It's near the near the tunnel, something that goes under the water. It's, it's not just called a tunnel, it's got another name. But it went to Alameda, and, and right before you came to there, not on Fruitvale Avenue, right but on that street down there, must have been six blocks and two blocks wide, six blocks along this street, which I'll pick up the name of. Fireworks, and there would be lights and everything else, and people were afraid to go down there. And as the police went down and tried to get them to stop, and then they brought the guys from the Na Alameda Navy Air Station, which is right across the estuary there. So what you're just saying down. is that most of these Japanese people were celebrating? Celebrating. In Oakland, in Oakland, Alameda, they were, because we could see it. You couldn't miss it. We lived up on the hill. Pima's was up on a hill. And you can see, we went home after our little directing traffic business in, on Broadway and uh, whatever the cross street was there, uh, by, oh, 8.30, 9 o'clock. And we had a big sun porch up on the second or third story of our house. And, uh, look at that, what the hell is that? Well, my father called somebody. And, they tried to stop them, but it, well, it, it was in hybrid things two days later. I, I never, I never, had you ever heard that song? Terrifying. Yeah. We knew full well. I was going to be smart enough to figure out what was going on. Okay, so, um, um, so then, so you're in the, the ROTC and going to Berkeley. And it became much more serious after the astronomy uh, uh, examination on Monday, December 8th. In fact, if not that autumn term, 
the following winter term, oh, I think we doubled the number of courses we were taking in the naval science, what they call it. We went from just ship handling and, and the terminology of, of the sea and the astronomy into uh, naval law, into uh, numerous uh, other uh, areas. Had you done much uh, boating and stuff like that around Open Bay or anything? No, up? just with friends who had yachts, like Herbie Hills, who had the Hills Brothers coffee bins up the street from us. He had an 80 foot yacht. And the guy from Capwell, Sullivan, or Firth, Dick Capwell. So you didn't have a necessary allegiance to the Navy. It was just, well, well, your dad was your dad, your dad, dad in the, the Navy. The Navy yeah, he was in the Navy in World War I. Oh, I meant that. Yeah, did he talk? What 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 was his? What did he do in the Navy during World War One? He was a second class seaman at. Oh, I know exactly where it was. It's a. Pelham. In fact, he had this line: "I fought the Battle of Pelham Bay and captured a rich wristwatch." That's what my father's story of the World War One was. Now Pelham is where? In Pelham is uh, 12 miles outside of New York City in Westchester County, and over by. Long Island Sound, there was this naval station, I guess, I never saw it. But the uh, German submarines came in pretty close. Sure did, right, right along the naval station. In World War II, not in World War I. Not in World War I, they didn't. But I know of, could have. Uh, so, did you assume then that you would probably be called up before long? I mean, when you were at the Yes. And I think it made our tendency to study and maintain a decent grade average um, a little uh, was more important. And when did you and Marna get engaged then? We were engaged on uh, November 7th, 1943. What was her maiden name? Marna Rager, R-E-A-G-O-R. -E her father was Dr. Paul Rager a Protestant and a First Christian Church minister in Oakland, head of the Red Cross in Oakland, head of the <coughs> Rotary Club in Oakland, a giant act of a guy, and the nicest, should have been a Catholic, one of the nicest guys you've ever met in your life. <laughs> Pretty and nice first we, huh? we used to do those jokes. It was great. It was great. <laughs> and uh, uh, so, and Marna, was that a problem, you being Catholic and her being Protestant at that time? Very possibly could have been if it hadn't been for Paul and it hadn't been for my mother, both who were very um, open-minded, broad-minded, intelligent people. Especially my mother, who was a genius if she hadn't had other damn kids to take care of. She, she became a, a, a screen uh, uh, a story editor at the Eagle Eye and Studios, became the West Coast editor of Good Housekeeping and Cosmopolitan Magazine, and would write interviews of movie people and what have you. Terrific woman. She was editor for, what say, Good Housekeeping? Good Housekeeping, the Western editor. Uh -huh. Good Housekeeping. And what else? Cosmopolitan. Now, had she been to college or something? She went for one year, and then my grandfather died on Christmas Eve, 1915. And the deal was that Uncle Dick, her brother, and Aunt Ethel, her sister, would raise, would go earn the money, and Mother, Ruth, would take care of Bimmy, Sarah Noonan, Berlin, the grand, my grandmother, mm -hmm. their mother. Mm -hmm. And it, uh, that was the way it was. Bimmy lived with us until she passed away on February 10th, uh, 1943 at 12.31 p.m. Terrific. And, and so when did you guys get married then? Got married on October 8th, 1944 in the uh, parish house at St. Patrick's. My, it was... You couldn't, it, couldn't go in the sanctuary. Couldn't, no. Couldn't go couldn't, in, I know, but my mom, mom and dad were the same. Yeah. <laughs> and it was interesting because it was the day that the uh, Al Smith, the great Democrat politician in New York, was lying in state in St. Patrick's. So when we came out of this door and down the three steps, these two old ladies in black said, My God, what a popular couple! 
Look at the people here. See, and at the same time, it sounds like such a made-up scenario. The Polish individual, or Czechoslovakian something, who wore those white skirt things and knee socks, were going up Madison Avenue, boom, boom, with this parade. And all this was taking place to attend the festivity of our marriage. Okay, now, okay, Saint, you're talking about you got married at St. Patrick's in New York? St. Patrick's, New York. Oh, I thought you were talking about... In the about parish house. Yeah, I know, in the parish house. <laughs> right. I, I, I thought you were talking about at your parish in, in Oakland. Oh, in and, Oakland, and, no, and, and, this, and this was going on on the other side. No, But, but it was sorry. at the same place. No, oh, I had been God. aboard the Missouri, and we'd been down to... Uh, to uh, Trinidad and Tobago on a oh. shakedown cruise, so okay. I came back and we got married. Oh, we got Okay. Didn't make that too clear. And what did that, what did that lady say again? My God, what a popular couple. <laughs> Look at all the people waiting to see them. So I, can, I can see her face. Looks exactly like Mimi, like my grandmother. <laughs> Wonderful thing. So we went over to the musty, dusty Mohawk Hotel in Brooklyn for our reception. And in the Navy, I should be telling you, gentlemen, it is protocol if you're to be married or make some extreme difference in your status, you so report that up the chain of command. I reported that to the gun boss, uh, Molly Malone, and then he reported it to the executive of Tosa, I mean to see Jaco Cooper, the executive officer in Missouri. I said, and you do this, you take your card, and you invite them to the ceremonies. And then, Jaco Cooper, real charmer, uh, said, you've got to go see Captain Callahan. So I went to see Captain Callahan. I should have brought the book of our wedding. Fascinating, because they all showed up. The captain, and the exec, and the gun boss, and the assistant gun boss, and the, and the, the first lieutenant, the damage control guy, Andy Smith. And they this all is, showed this up. This from the Missouri, right? From the Missouri. Everybody showed up. And Captain Walt Rodee gave Marna away, an old friend of the family from, from uh, Seattle. He had been the, the air boss on the, on the, either the Yorktown or the other one that had just been sunk. Lexington? No. Wasn't one of the, the Yorktown or the other one with a fancy name. Mm -hmm. And he was, uh, Got in the Navy Cross and something gun landed on some other thing at the Battle of what would have been Midway, I guess. I'm not sure of that, but he was on. Yeah, it was a flyer. Terrific, Walt Rodi. Yeah. Well, the Yorktown went down at Midway, and Lexington went down to Coral Sea. Coral Sea would no, it would have been Midway. Midway. Yeah. Huh. So, um, and they came to the wedding. They yeah. did. Uh -huh. To the wedding and to the reception, to the reception. over at the Mohawk, Mohawk Hotel, Hotel in <laughs> Brooklyn, the cheapest place you could possibly, possibly have a room in. And Marna and I had this room, and the, the escalation of mortification <laughs> when the bed broke and shattered something in the neighborhood of a chandelier or something in the dining room below where our room was. <laughs> God, it was just terrible. <laughs> and, then, <laughs> and I'd go out, I'd leave there in the morning, I'd leave at 5, 30, 6 o'clock, to make 7 o'clock quarters at the board of Missouri in the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And these crones, there's no other word, but he's in there. Great. <laughs> the wedding cake cost $8.50 cash. <laughs> And Bill Kitts, who was my best man, as you might say, whose father was an admiral, Bill Kitts loaned me two hundred dollars to go to to either pay for part of the wedding or or to go on a honeymoon. I can't remember which why he loaned, but I paid it back. And we went to uh, a couple weekends later. I got a weekend pass or whatever you got. We got leave, and the sailors got liberty, so we got leave. And we went to Pennsylvania to the to a lake. 
I'm not here terribly, just a little bit. I'm sorry. Yeah, no, no, that's fine, no problem. I just want to get you centered up here a little bit. Okay, let's go back then. Um, so when did you get notified that you were going on active duty then? Uh, uh, in the, in the, the room 1000 of the Life Science Building at Berkeley, the whole Naval uh, ROTC uh, company was uh, told to come to an 11 a.m. Uh, must attend a meeting. And, uh, and uh, the Commander Marsh, the executive officer of this unit, stood up and uh, introduced Captain Kays, K-A-Y-E-S, a person who on a good day was five feet seven and was an old person who they brought back in because of the unpleasantness. And uh, Captain Kays said, I'm so proud of you boys or anything else. Then Commander Marsh got back on and said, we know that this will come as a surprise to the 64 members of the junior class. But you're going to be given an opportunity to get your commission immediately so that you can serve your country. And then, and I quote, when you come back, and I upstood some individual from the registrar's office in Berkeley, University California, we'll take care of you when you come back to school. Make this very quick. I didn't stand up with the 63 other fellows, and Dick Henderson, the captain of the basketball team, jabbed me in the wrist. Stand up, you know. And I said, well, I don't want to leave now. Everything's going just fine. And I want to, it's been hard enough for me to stay in school. I want to stay. Stand up, Petty. So I stood up. And on February 4th, we got our, we were commissioned, for instance, at the United States Naval Reserve. And, uh, Four days after that, four of us, I can't remember all my names, Buddy Cruz and Mark Hurd and some other guy, were all going to to SCTC, Subcaster Training Center. And that was a plush birth in February 1944. Most people, almost our entire class, went to the Carolina landing barge people school, which didn't have to be the best job in the history of show business, I'll tell you. So we went to, got on the, got on the super chief, or the chief, or so, over at Unlimited. I went to Chicago, uh, and we had a drawing room, four of us, and slipped on the floor, alternate nights or something. And we went to Chicago, and the publisher of the Chicago American, who worked for my uncle, had us to a sumptuous dinner at the Drake Hotel, and then a party of some sort. And uh, we were the only 20-year-old guys in the entire place. Everybody else was 83. Uh, it was a wonderful party, as I remember. And we went to New York, and my uncle arranged all these great things for us. The parties and to the ice capades at the at the civics at the city center. It's near Radio City Music Hall. And then we got on either planes or trains, I can't remember which, and went to uh, Miami to SCTC. And then we all split up and I, as I told you earlier, went down for YP three nine two out of Key West, Coast Guard section base. And that was a uh what was it, a YP? YP, Converted Yacht, number 392. It was called the Sea Witch. It's a quite famous yacht. It had once been owned by one of the Vanderbilts, and I don't know which one. It's not important. But the, as I said, with one 20 millimeter machine gun that worked, the other one didn't work at all, we would go out and just and draw a trough in the water between Key West and Cuba looking for for some reason, we never found one, forget it. You know, it was about those Japanese people in Honolulu the other day. I mean, we were in much worse shape than they were if we ever found them, some reason. Oh, so then we went back to SCTC, and we went out on PCs, out into the Gulf Stream, for this other training afloat, everything, from flag hoist to the Morse code and the thing, to seamanship, and bringing it, and there were 18 of us, 18, Instance, and 17 became deathly ill. And I was holding the thing, and joined with this, and steering, and this chief, Betty Arthur said, 
I said, right, didn't you eat? And I said, I, I, don't, I don't, wouldn't dare get seasick. My uncle would kill me. <laughs> we got that put back in. You pull these pieces, and I got to bring this uh, a little bit. Anyway, huge blackboard at the end of this walk out of this period, walked up towards the, the operations thing. And on this blackboard, a great big chalk mark was Commander Buckley and Ensign Harbert report to operations. And I said, oh boy, and they found out something that wasn't as good as some of the guys that had the landing barges. I went up to Camp Commander Buckley, by the way, you don't remember, is one of the people involved in taking General MacArthur off. He boats. He boats off the Yeah, to, uh, to Australia with to, uh, to sure. re-fuelings uh, in, in between. And so I uh, went up there, and uh, sure enough, Commander Buckley was there, and he uh, had been the skipper of this flotilla of four PCs that had been out there in the... <laughs> he said, well, you did pretty well out there today, I understand, from the chief. I said, well, I, all I didn't do was get sick like everybody else. I don't know what's wrong with them. They must have been out last night. Or and he said, what are you up here for? And I said, well, I'm in some... Harvard they had down there. He said, Jesus. And the wave lady behind the desk said, Honey, I don't know who you are, but I hope you take me with you. And I looked at Commander Buckley, and I, funny thing, sympathetic perspiration. I am blushing now. I can remember how I felt. Literally, I flushed, I'm sure. She said, I've been here two and a half years. We never had anybody go to a destroyer, much less the goddamn Missouri. And Buckley said, hey, that's pretty good, kid. How'd you do that? And I said, I don't think we really want to know about it. But the truth of the matter was, back to Frank Knox getting me in the Naval ROTC at Southern Stanford. My uncle said, this kid is down there. And he made it through ROTC. He's done pretty well down there. But he didn't want a cushy job, doesn't want a job in Washington, doesn't want to be on a PR staff or anything. But his mother would never <laughs> speak to me again if he was on some little piddling boat. So, so what would you put him on? What on the bigger damn thing we've got? So Frank Knox and the, the future uh, governor of, uh, of uh, Texas, who uh, got shot by oh, Jack Kelly, got shot by Conley. Uh, arranged for me to be transferred from SCTC to the pre-commissioning detail of the USS Missouri at uh, Newport, Rhode Island. And uh, boy, that sure be working, because I got up there about three days before. So the Missouri was there at Newport? No, no, it was at Brooklyn Navy Yard. I was in, just finishing, I was about to be commissioned. And uh, we were at, uh, it was a pre-commissioning detail. We marched around and took courses and studied what you had studied it. Well, I had an awful lot of ensigns. About, let's say that there were 40 ensigns in there. I'd say 12 of us were from Naval ROTC uh, programs around the country, North Carolina, Northwestern, uh, University of Southern Cal uh, UCLA, Berkeley, uh, Washington, uh, quite a few from North Carolina. Pretty good guys. And then we had a coterie of ensigns who were just out of the Naval Academy. And for all practical purposes, how often you've heard uh, the names of the, of the trade school boys taken in vain, they were just terrific. Not only good guys, but they knew about 84 times as much as we did and helped us. trying to figure out how the computers work to guide the guns, the five inch that I was going to be working on. Much more slowly you take this. Great guys. We had a bunch of them. Jack Barron and, and, and in fact a guy named Doug Plate who was and now they, they were, uh, what was their rate or what were they? They were ensigns. Ensigns too. Yeah. They had just gotten out. See, we were graduated. They are kicked out. Not graduated, but given our commissions in February, they were in the late May class of the uh, of the Naval Academy. Oh, okay. And uh, got that was a good billet for them to be aboard the uh, ship. See that President, the Vice President Truman, of course, was uh, Missourian, and so he was. Uh, now, uh, because the aircraft carrier had been 
so superior, why did they bother to come up with another battleship? We were the best anti-aircraft protection that a, other than their own pilots that an aircraft carrier could get. And I tell you, when we would be at Mog Mog and Ulithi Lagoon or at Guam, <coughs> the guys in the carriers say, stick close to us now because we could shoot. I mean, the USS Missouri and New Jersey, we could knock something out of the air at 15 miles. It was just amazing. These guys were so good. They were just, the, well, they were the best. They got the best guys from from the South Dakota, from the North Carolina, or even from the Texas, from the Arizona, the three guys that made it who had been anti-aircraft. Fortunately, they'd been on watch topside when the awfulness started. And we had these guys, and they were just unbelievable. And the main battery guys who shot those 16-inch bullets, amazing. I mean, I impressed. I didn't know anything about what I was being pressed about, but I was sure impressed by the capacity for learning and for instructing, for helping, and the and the uh, and the uh, uh, enlisted personnel who were really carefully uh, picked. I think and slotted for that. Okay, so you you were in charge of a five-inch mount. No, when I started, I was in the forty millimeter, a two quads of forty millimeter guns, uh, one on the port side of the flying bridge, the O5 level. Okay, by two quads, you mean there were two, like eight, four, a cluster of four 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 barrels, barrels. four barrels, okay. and four guys, loaders that put these clips of four forty millimeter. Those in the, the Okay, a 40 millimeter would be compromised. I mean, what would be compromised? It uh, would well. be like uh, almost an inch. The the, the, the fire, the the the, bow, the the shell part of it. The shell was this long, with the powder here, and then this this narrower. Thing. Right. Well, I wish I had 40 millimeter. Is that what they call out. those pom pom guns? Pom pom. Okay. Yeah, the they were different than the ones the British had, because the British one pom pom. Purpose ours was open, and usually because we trained so assiduously. How fast could they load those? Oh things? boy, we could pump out uh, 65, 70 uh, per barrel per minute. I mean, it was just boom, just boom, boom. This is the skies. They come up on a on a track out of the magazine down below, and these guys take them and they and it's almost a throw. They take it out of this, and this other guy gets it. He gets it here and jams it in there. I couldn't have done that work that these guys did. They were unbelievable uh, to watch and uh, you know, throw out. And we just blanket. And the, the, the reason we didn't get hit by more kamikazes after we sunk the Yamamoto, after our task group and task force did, they came after the Missouri. Forget the carriers for a while. They came after us. We got hit by one. One kamikaze, half of a kamikaze, and half of a Japanese uh, air uh, aviator would be cut in half with the bullets, and it came aboard on the starboard side between uh, mounts uh, three and five uh, on the uh, 04 level. And we had full honors burial for the half of the Japanese the next day under Japanese flag. So when did the uh, when was the Missouri commissioned there? In the we went down on a big tank, big freighter, a big personnel carrier ship, 485 feet from Newport to the Brooklyn Navy Yard. And I would guess the and I should have done some homework on this, oh, David, and I didn't do it. Yeah. It would be near July. Uh, very early, uh, late June, early July of 1944, uh, with Margaret Truman, with the, uh, she was attractive, she's right in here. She came aboard, and they asked me, please take us out that night, and I explained to the to Admiral Ingersoll that I was a married person. And he said, well, that's a shame, we have a wonderful party in this drug and I said, I go every weekend myself. And her three friends from wherever the hell they went to. Did she christen the children? Yeah. 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 Yeah.
Uh, and so then we took off for uh, Trinidad for the, uh, along with the uh, Alaska. They had these pocket, pocket battleships like the Grouse Bay, Bay yeah. that were going to be much faster than the uh, Iowa class, the Missouri, New Jersey, Wisconsin, and ourselves. Uh, one of our, one of our practices at Trinidad was for the Alaska to tow us in case we'd been shot up. Well, that poor something. There was no way in the world that that ship was going to tow 56,000 tons. Of yeah, I, now I say that I saw <laughs> it stirred. Now everybody tells me that is just my imagination. From my point of apparent safety, where I was in Sky Two that day watching, <laughs> I swear, but it never moved an inch. <laughs> we pulled it, we jerked it through the water and fine stuff. But getting the enormous uh, eight-inch uh, uh, hawsers aboard, you, you know, you have to take them in a motor whaleboat. Boy, I'm glad I didn't get that job, but the guys did that, they dropped it about five. Did you go through the Panama Canal? We went through the Panama Canal. With much room to spare? Well, about, the, about three inches on either side. In fact, we scraped off Davids uh, going through, and a number of things had to be replaced. And in fact, Tom McGinnis, who was a resident at PGA West, was living in the canal zone at the time, and uh, remembers everybody going out to uh, view this newest of battleships go through. And I remember there being out there shouting good wishes to him. So we had, we, we stayed in the freshwater lake in the middle of the canal to get the barnacles off uh, for a day and a half or two days. And we got shore leave to Balboa or something, or Bilboa or something where there were the most vile possible nightclub shows, which my friends suggested we should go, and I got lost trying to get back to the ship. I mean, damn, I was just bad stuff. And these guys should never have been in there, because some... Was that southern Mexico, or no, just back in the States? No, in was Panama. Panama. Oh, in Panama. In Panama. Oh, in Panama. When you, Panama there, 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 there's yeah. Panama City, but then there's yeah. another place Okay. at the other end oh, of yeah, the right. Okay. And that's where we went. And so I got George Barber. George, these guys, the shore patrol is going to come along, and everybody is going to be, and he said, oh, you know, he said they wouldn't dare. Two of our guys got the shore patrol, took them over to some awful place, and they got, it was just silly, it was just awful. But that was what Panama was about in those days, I guess. I am General Manuel Noriega. Is that the upper panel? Yeah, he's in the pokey in Miami. Yeah. Right <laughs> um, so, okay, okay, well, okay, you were on 40 millimeters first, you said. 40, 40 millimeters. Through. And, and, and so when you when you say you're on them, did you, what was your job? I was the, I was the gun placement officer, and I was on the phones, and we would, they would give us a, a, an angle at which this interloper Japanese plane was expected. So for our practice around Hawaii, when we got there on Christmas Eve 1944, oh no, we first had done it, of course, obviously, on the, on the, uh, on the shakedown cruise. And they would fly these planes by with those sleeves on the back of them, uh, you know, and you'd shoot at them. And I suggested that the gun boss, Commander Malone, and his assistant, H.B. Dickey Bird, whose father in law was a vice admiral, that we couldn't see upon these things. Because I got up there and said, the guys put it in. And I, I said, I can't see them. I can never see an airplane. What, how far are these guns going to be able to shoot? Oh, up to three miles. I said, I, there's no way in the world through this little scope. So, I drew a drawing, great artistic capacity, drew a thing that I had seen, get us a little radar so we can go up there. To make a long story short, I got 
they tell me I got a Secretary of Navy commendation. I never saw it because we went to San Francisco instead of right straight through the Panama Canal out to Hawaii after the war to get four of these new little radars that they put right on top of the of the pointer thing. Which is how you see a lot of those photographs. Yeah. Is how you that see thing on with them. that thing on them. And, like and with the, yeah, spent, yeah. Kind of uh, with a little oscillator thing that goes like that that sends out this thing. Mm -hmm. Well, thank goodness young man who was my pointer. Thank goodness he could see this. See, you have this little scope, and then a flip comes up. And if you get out of that, then you find it. Then you tie it into the computer, and it takes care of pointing those guns to lead and whatever, whatever. But these, so we, we got an extra week in San Francisco, my home port, right. to get these darn things put on the Missouri. It was great. And everybody thought it was fun. And so HB, I bet you H.B. Bird took that, because it was to him that I took the idea. I bet you he got it, because he needed it, because he, he became LBJ's uh, naval aide during, uh, after, the, after Mr. Kennedy was killed. Horace Virgil Bird, Dickie Bird. And they, and they worked for the 40 millimeter, but fortunately, a fellow <coughs> who was in Sky 2 with Jack Wiggins, the, 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 the five-inch director that, that controlled mounts two, four, and six on the port side, two barrels each, got transferred to some place, and I got taken off the 40 millimeter thing and put up in the five-inch, which was a lot spiffier because it was comfortable up there, and also during one of our first night engagements, on this 40 millimeter, we had the Santa Fe, an air, they call it an anti-aircraft cruiser. It must have had a million guns on it and they were shooting them all toward us. And these tracers, once, on every fifth bullet, yeah. would go screaming over the Missouri. I thought, well, this is just terrible. I sure wish I were doing something else. And within two weeks, there I was up in the five-inch mountains. It was great. Five-inch director. Okay, now tell me about a five inch. Uh, okay, and you say, is the 40 millimeter had a three mile range? Three mile outside range. It was a big, it was a big round, David. The damn yeah. thing was that long. Right. Big down at the end, yeah. and then the bullet I was smaller. I'm talking about, I've seen them. Yeah. Okay, now you tell me about the five inch. Yeah. Five inch is a, is a wonderful weapon because it is controlled. Once your Mark 22 and Mark 12 radar, the big one, like the display, and then a smaller one on the side, once you focus in, get, get, catch a plane coming towards you, then you hit the automatic button, the green button to the right of your slewing thing to move the thing around, and it goes down into fire control one on the sixth deck down, the sixth deck. And they create, and they tell you up over the headphone, solution, because now, then you just take off or anything, and you tell the guys, stand by to commence firing, and boom, all six of these the barrels from the three five-inch mounts on the port side let loose, and they can put out about 18 of those a minute. And I tell you, it's the fastest thing here. How they do that fast, I don't never know. I've been in the mount when they've been loading. It's amazing. It's 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 a fixed ammunition. Thing. By that you mean? What well, you have you have the bullet, and then you have the the powder. It's fixed. Well, in the 16 inch thing, it's a huge 2,000 pound thing, and then four bags of red oh, oh, I powder. Guess. Okay, so it has the powder in it in, in, the, in the bullet. That's itself. correct. And so that's one things when the kamikazes really started going, especially after the picket ships, the destroyers, those poor guys and those things were out there on the perimeter, well past the perimeter of the task group or task force, always between Japan and Orokinawa, and Orokinawa, uh, to be able to notify us, they really didn't have much chance to shoot them down, notify of incoming they had excellent radar coming uh, Japanese.
these planes coming toward the task group. And, you know, day after day, a uh, destroyer be sunk with 208 guys on it. It's just terrible. So what you're saying is this 5-inch had the range to, to help protect those destroyers? No, uh, no. To help protect the carriers, that was the only job. Other than that, Don't shoot at anything until you can see it or the radar picks it up. And those bogeys would come in and, you know, usually at, uh, they like to come in at, at uh, daybreak or right at dusk when the seeing is difficult for everybody. And so we had the task group commander, which was 58.4. We had an admiral by the name of Arthur Radford, R-A-D-F-O-R-D, who worked for Admiral Halsey, as did Race Bruins. And we always called him Shaky Radford, and the reason for it was this. For our first number of months in the Central Pacific, we would have dawn alert. So you would go to dawn alert one hour before dawn and stay until one hour after dawn. Then you would go to have your breakfast, and if you were on condition three, if it were your watch, you'd go back on the guns. And if you uh, had the watch that was in place when the, the underground work, you stayed there and they brought you up something. Shaky felt that not enough protection was being given his carriers during that downtime, that change time, and the, because in fact, and he was right, the Bonhomme Richard or something else got hit right during the so from then on, for our dawn alert, at dawn we're 4.30, we got up at 2 o'clock in the morning, had our breakfast, then went on the guns and stayed on through dawn alert into 6 or 7 o'clock in the morning. Well, that was fine for all the fellows in the, a, for in the main battery, the 16-inch, all the guys in the uh, control rooms, all the guys in communications, and, and all the guys in stewards mates and everybody else. That was a great job. The poor oafs in the anti-aircraft battery, such as us, sometimes I would go to bed after dawn, uh, after dusk alert, 7 o'clock, sleep until 11.15. That would be my entire sleep period for 24 hours, because from then on, I was on the guns. And so we got to a point after a while where, you know, discussion, with I just talked to, to Commander Bird and said, you know, some of these guys from the uh, main battery are very smart guys and they can do a heck of a lot more than just, because we're never going to shoot those big guns again unless something good happens like Okinawa did shortly thereafter. And, uh, he said, what are you suggesting? I said, let's break it up a little bit and have them stand some some watches. The four-hour four hour watches so that we can get just a touch more sleep because we're not going to be very good at doing this. I'm not the only one who said that. Earl Pardue from North Carolina was in the meeting. Warner Mallison from Duke was also an ensign uh, from Naval ROTC. And we said, this is fine, but it's very difficult to stay alert. And so they changed that a little bit, and that was a help. But that's what we did. And we were there to shoot down airplanes that were going to uh, attack the carriers. And boy. Do you have any idea how many you shot down? The first one was on our way from Hawaii to, to Ulithi Lagoon. It had to be a, a, a spotter, spotting uh, seaplane of the Japanese. It was at about 16, 17,000 feet. And we got it on our radar, on the big radar, and then Sky One, which I was not in, got it on its radar. That's the Mark 12 and the Mark 22. And they asked permission to open fire, and the gun boss said, uh, Do we know what we have?
have up there, I can hear it, is on the 5JP, which is a talk circuit for the anti-aircraft division. And, uh, oh, uh, Art Hayes, uh, the guy from Northwestern, said, well, who else would be dumb enough to be up there in the middle of the ocean at midnight? And so we said, and we fired the five inch up there, and after 15 or 20 rounds, this thing caught on fire, and, and uh, sure enough, it was a Japanese seaplane, spotter plane. Probably couldn't make 75 knots downhill, you know. And so that's, uh, after that, boy, with that much firepower in a task group like 58.4 or 38.4, when Admiral Halsey put his his uh, flag in the Missouri uh, near the uh, uh, end of August, near, near the end of, uh, of uh, July, uh, 1945. In July, I guess, maybe before that. Uh, you, you, there's so much firepower, there's so many bullets going out there against the Japanese players. But with the plan, always they came down as low as they could, you know, right next to the water. Then they'd umbrella up and dive into the carriers, and that's and we watched that and it was just it was heartbreaking to watch and to watch these guys try to bring these beaten up planes back in, especially on things like the Independence and the smaller carriers. Uh, wow, that's just difficult work. But we now when all okay, you're putting all this firepower out. What are our planes doing? I mean, do they stay out of range? The heartbreaking thing is that occasionally I remember that the Santa Fe knocked one of the uh, Groman uh, F4Us out. It was just on the tail of this uh, of the Zeke coming in. It was right on the tail. Boom, it got them both. And, uh, and oh, boy, guys just fall apart. The guys on the... the I'm sure that the geniuses around me knew that the anti-aircraft cruiser was a great idea, but boy, that many guns on a little ship like that, and they shoot in any given direction, when in doubt, shoot, is what their maxim was, and that's all right, but boy, they just shot everywhere, and so they got, we saw two or three, we saw an F-6F, and he tried to make it to this, uh, I can't remember which carrier it was, tried to make it to the carrier, when the and the drink got just short of the deck, and the point is, we never knew. We saw a, a destroyer uh, leave station, go over and look for him, but you never hear any report. And you saw uh, you saw some of our ships uh, being hit by the kamikaze. And and what would you see? Just an explosion? No, like an incredible explosion. The, 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 just two or three explosions, because once once one of the once one of the things like a, a Zeke or a Tony that can carry a thousand pound bomb, once it hits that flight deck and that bomb goes right through down into the hangar deck and that's where all the aviation fuel is stored and boy, this, this flame goes, this billowing flame goes up 150 feet in the air and you say, oh my God. David Foster, who I interviewed, uh, was uh, a Royal Navy pilot and, yeah. and flew uh, off of the uh, Said that the British uh, carriers had steel decks and we had wooden decks. We had wooden decks. And the wooden decks were lighter, so we were faster. But he said that the kamikazes didn't hurt them near as much because they would bounce off and they wouldn't go through the oh, deck. They, they wouldn't really? go through the decks like they went ours. Was that our Nabisco David Foster? Mm -hmm. What a terrific film. Isn't it good? Oh, yeah. 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 I've got it. You'll have to see it. I'd love to. Have a story out there. It's really I'd love really to. Good. Yeah. Terrific. Yeah. Um, yeah. yeah. We saw also the destroyers limping back from the pick of duty. And once we took 15 guys off the 484, whatever, the Dickinson or something like that, and uh, went to our sick bay. And they were pretty badly shot up. And so there was a guy named Jim McCambridge from Boston. And uh, which uh, task force were you at? First, we were at 58.4. That was task group 58.4. That's called the Fifth Fleet, the Raymond Spruance Fifth Fleet. And then, with the change in the earlier 
mid-spring uh, 1945, we became the third fleet, and we were 38.4. And uh, that was when Admiral Halsey moved his uh, lock, stock, and barrel, his staff, into the Missouri. I used to have a, had this terrific room on the 06 level up there, Al Kelly, a Marine, lieutenant from the R-98 and Marine group. And I had this wonderful thing, and we'd lock that door down with us. David's and then we'd open this wonderful port on a gorgeous breeze up that high. And then the then Halsey came aboard and all of a sudden I guess twenty-four of our of the ensigns of ships ship's company made their domicile in Boys Town and Girls Town on the port and starboard side of the O one level. And unless you're a bona fide fraternity sleeper on sleeping porches with a lot of guys, that was the most awful <laughs> period. It was just it's like being in, in a dorm. It, it's what it's like, but, but three deep. It was like, well, it was just, it, it was an enlisted man's quarters. Yeah. And that's not to sound, okay, we had a better mattress or whatever we had. But guys, I tried to get them to, uh, to get the, uh, I can see the guys, Butch Player. Uh, was a uh, was a uh, lieutenant commander uh, in the main battery, the 16-inch stuff, and he uh, had been a great uh, football player at the Naval Academy. And so I went to Butch once and said, is there any way that we can put all the, we have first, second, and third watch, as you know, three watches, all first watch guys or something in our in girls' town? Because guys are getting up, up, and down, and you wake up every, 35 minutes, and, I, and he said, no, there's no way of doing that. And I said, okay. Did you see Halsey much when he was on board? Yes, he used to play a thing called deck tennis. It's a little coit, a round rubber thing, and he had like a volleyball net. Up. And these, he'd have these guys with him, and they'd play, oh, three or four mornings a week, and we weren't shooting at people, and they would, Admiral Halsey was incredibly active. Pleasant. Once he just climbed right up on the out the outside ladder of Sky uh, One, I was on my 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 condition three uh, work was always in Sky One because Sky One and Sky Four, the one on the after uh, deck, after uh, area of the ship, uh, were the ones that were manned because we could one would take all the port side mounts and one could take all the starboard side mounts. So. So uh, once he just climbed up this thing on this ladder, said, how you doing? Pretty good, Admiral. I'd right. like to get in here. I've been in there. And I say, he said, uh, so are you the guy that uh, tried to get our uh, coit, our, our thing back? And I said, yes, sir. I was in and then I missed it. Yeah, he said, I'm going to go to the side. They had a bunch of them. They play this game and the wind oh. take him and then I tried to catch it. No. He was he was great. The, of course the guys with him were just the niftiest reservists. He had Jim Kitchell, who was a city editor of the Los Angeles Times. He had uh, other terrific guys from industry and from the media who were on his staff, and they really, it was he, it was Jim Kitchell. I uh, would love it if he was still alive. He was probably eight, 10 years old, 15 years older than I. He was the one after, when we were sailing towards Tokyo Bay, after the war was over, uh, to go up uh, into Sagami Wan and for the surrender. He said, that, boy, this is sure better than the, what we were gonna be doing here. And he showed me those plans. And those plans. By the way, let's, we'll get that back. Do you recall when you first heard about the atomic bomb, Big John? Yes. It was right after a tough day. And Captain Stuart Murray had replaced Captain Callahan, who became a rear admiral. His brother Daniel Callahan was, was a guy killed on the San Francisco right. with Gene Witter, our friend from high school. 
Captain Murray said, there is an announcement that we have been notified to stand by for in the next 10 minutes. Everyone please stand by. And you know, announcements in the Navy that could mean nothing but something bad. I mean, and they had President Truman, his announcement to the troops, to the, to the military establishment of the United States of America. Wasn't very clear. Today we have I wrote it down. And so we talked for about two minutes, and then Captain Murray came on again and said, as we get more information, we'll let you know. So what did you, what was your thought? What, what was your first thought when you did? Oh. As a little bit of of personal fun at Berkeley, I volunteered as a student cleanup person at the cyclotron. And there I met Dr. Ernest O. Lawrence, one of our one of our cyclotron genes. I was the head of the system up there. I'm sure it was Ernest O. Lawrence, as I recall. And so I would go up two afternoons a week clean up a area where they had had students in doing work and the idea was to get every piece of paper and throw it in this gray thing that if you put it in you could never get it out. The thing only opened going down and you're trying to put your hand in your hands gone. I didn't try that. And so so the day after they had this announcement George Barber who was a physics, uh, a physics student at Berkeley, a year ahead of me, that was born in Missouri. I said, uh, he said, well, all I know, he said, a little bit of, 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 of well, not plutonium, it's the first, uranium. uranium. A little bit of uranium is fine and inert, nothing happens. You put enough of it together, it'll blow your head off. In a nutcase, I drew a radial motor, like on a thing, and if you had 12, as they did on that plane that I remember seeing in 1930 or something, these pistons that came down to drive this thing, if you had 12 little pieces of uranium and had some way to get them all together, it'd probably blow up. So unfortunately, I left that on my desk, and, and George T. Terrahue, T-E-R-H-U-N-E. -E. He had a great big mustache. He was a swarthy looking individual. I thought he was Turkish, and he probably was. Came in to talk to, uh, why had I moved out of Girlstown? Oh, yeah, when you made JG, you got to move out of Girlstown. So three of us that are in Girlstown, Hank Walker from Honolulu, and uh, Earl Pardue from North Carolina, we all made JG the same day. And so, also, we're back in living it up in our own state room, which is great. So, out of the George you came in to see, I guess it was Al Kelly again. He was already a first lieutenant in the Marine. And uh, I got called up to the exec's office. What's this? And I tried to explain to him. He said, well, he was a very tough guy, Jocko. He said, don't do that anymore. And he tore it out. Don't do that. I don't know what he's doing about it. George Jerry was the church. Um, yeah, all I can remember is that if that is, if, no, I don't remember. All I, all I recall is why don't they do it? What, what is something called Hiroshima? I had no idea where that was. I tried to get this map down there in plot, and it uh, had this little teeny thing down by the southern coast of Japan. But you weren't surprised that a very large bomb had been developed when you were there. What? I think a surprised is probably a very good word to knock off there. No. 
Because, as you know, so much gossip. I mean, there was constant guy. You get on a big ship like that, you got people in and out. I mean, the, on the breaches buoy, they'd bring these cans alongside, and we'd refuel them. And then four guys would come over, and three of our guys would leave. You had a constant interplay from various other ships, you know. And uh, and then when the wonderful fleet tankers would come alongside and take four hours to refuel the Missouri, and then the fleet and the fleet uh, transport or the things with the wonderful fresh food in, and they come out on the starboard side. We'd go along, and here'd be the here'd be the fleet tanker, here'd be the other. And we'd we would run into each other. So you were starting to tell me you saw like the probably the plans for the invasion of Japan. Yes. And tell me about that. There were 408 or 18 U.S. vessels, 23 British vessels, including the KG-5. Everything except the aircraft carriers that we had. And they had this map of where, here's Tokyo, here's Tokyo, here's Sagami 1, here's the cut that you go in from the sea up into Tokyo Bay, Sagami 1. And, and 7 or 11 miles due east of this was a, a beach area where we were all going to run aground, and it showed. They said, here were the capital ships, here were the Missouri, the uh, uh, Iowa, the New Jersey, the Wisconsin, the Alaska, and then the heavy cruisers, the whole this, uh, Helena, uh, Helena uh, all this, uh, and right down. But the point of the whole thing was, we were going to be either at Ulithia or probably at Guam by now, or maybe even Okinawa now by Naha Harbor. Every spot of those vessels was going to be covered with 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 uh, bullets, with with shells, and the idea we're going to run up on the shore. He showed it. It was a very simple plan, and just keep the Missouri would go almost straight because we could not bring to bear turret three, except about 98, 100 degrees this way, maybe a little bit. And we would just keep firing, firing, firing till we ran out of bullets. And then the Marines, with my pal, my roommate Al Kelly, were going to lead us all with bayonets affixed. And we had, were going to have, we we're going to have 2,700 idiots going over the side and going up the beaches and march on Tokyo. Every piece of personnel. And because there was going to be no need for these ships anymore, because we were going to wipe out Japan. And I just, I, I will never forget, that was the night before we entered Sagami wanted to go into Tokyo Bay. And I had opened, Marna had smuggled aboard at San Francisco the last night before we left, a bottle of what I called Shenley's Black Death. It was a supposed bourbon or blend. And the bottom, you could see at least a quarter inch of silt <laughs> in the bottom, and you pour it very quickly. But I had had that thing locked up since we left, since December of 1944, when we left San Francisco, and we opened it. And, and Mr. Kitchell came down and had a Lieutenant Commander Kitchell had a drink with Al and me, and and George Barber and Colonel uh, Pardew. And he showed us this thing. He said, "Boy, this girl, you're going to be a better approach to, to." Uh, Why don't you take this? I got yes. a map up there. It's not all that good, but Tokyo is up there. Wow. And uh, I'm going to kind of focus in on this a bit. Fine. Okay, uh, so if you can kind of show me where you're kind of talking about there, and okay. kind of and where you guys came from, and Fine. how you got up into there. On on August, I believe it was on August eighth, when we were just cleaning up and doing airstrikes. We had been up to Hokkaido with an airstrike with two British carriers, our carriers, and the KG-5, 
and we had bombarded on the southern coast of Hokkaido. And then we'd gone back down here, we were probably 200, 300 miles off, off the coast of Japan, and we were ordered 400 miles southeast to be north of Iwo, Jiman King. And, and Commander Kitchell said that was because they weren't sure whether it would blow up the whole island or not. And I said, well, that's unlikely. When we started in, we went back, we were close to Iwo. Iwo's right down. Yeah, there, right it is. there it is. There it is. We went over and went up along the coast of <coughs> the Ryukus <coughs> in Okinawa and past Kyushu and up into the cut, which is a cut through that must be six or eight miles long up into Tokyo Bay. Mm -hmm. On either side of that cut were Japanese guns, I would say in the three to five inch area, all with their barrels tilted down. Yeah. Oh, okay. And however, we were at full condition one uh, uh, general quarters with everything with the, with, the, with the turret one of the 16 inch pointed, pointed uh, right at the uh, side of where Yokosuka Naval Base would be, mm -hmm. uh, which was about, I think, 11, and it just kept, as we move forward, it would just keep slowing back so that it would always be there. Turret 2 was headed towards something on the, on the right-hand side, the eastern side of Tokyo Bay. I don't know what its target was. Yeah. And, and Turret 3, I don't know where it was going, back somewhere. Mm. Wow. Yeah. That's a great, that's a great <laughs> Yeah. We got in on the August 31st into Tokyo Bay. Yeah. When did you find out that the surrender was going to take place on, about the, on your ship? About the 26th or 27th of, uh, of August, and I'll tell you why. Uh, because we had, uh, again, everybody, I think, worked to get the ship in absolutely ship shape uh, right. condition. Uh, the, uh, uh, we did not start uh, taking the uh, painted decks uh, down to their normal beautiful teak till the day we left Tokyo Bay and went in uh, steam at the flank uh, speed all the way to uh, to Honolulu, to, uh, to Fort Island, uh, Pearl Harbor. Uh, the, uh, we found that out and there was, and Commander Byrd, that was April, what did you say? That, that was uh, August 26th, oh, yeah. August 20th, uh, because we took four days to get back. Oh yeah, we got good provisions. We, they brought aboard uh, provisions uh, for Admiral Nimitz's uh, party for General MacArthur, I guess, up in the, uh, the Admiral's country on uh, the day of the uh, surrender uh, ceremony. Um, and and Commander Byrd uh, uh, selected eight of us to be officer escorts, we were going to be called. We had this little E on our thing, and we were to be uh, available to uh, uh, take the, uh, to bring the uh, various and, and sundry uh, f foreign dignitaries uh, from the uh, 12 uh, countries involved. Uh, and help them show them what it was they wanted to see. And so, on the day of the surrender that morning, we uh, we got our little things. I want you to see it. So here. Are we in my, no, you're room? fine. No, no, no. You're just fine. I was okay. just. Uh, I'm just moving this a little bit. had a meeting and what our job was going to be that day. And, and what, what, what date was that? On this was September 2nd, September the morning, September 6th, 0600. 
and uh, and Commander Byrd said, Ted, I want you to be uh, the real officer of the deck was on the starboard side where the Japs were going to come aboard. All the foreign dignitaries were going to uh, aboard from the port side. We had a spar down there, about 30 feet uh, wide and 12, 14 feet deep. And uh, so they started, the foreign people started, and they would salute the flag and salute me and the British to come aboard, sir, in some various language. And so General Jacques Leclerc, came aboard, and from my very, right here, and from my very excellent C-plus uh, high school French, I said, Bienvenue, mon général, and in the most gorgeous Oxford, he said, how charming, how terribly nice of you to have heard that. <laughs> how terribly nice, it was just charming. And then the Dutch gentleman came aboard, and he said, I'd sure like to get some to eat. I hadn't eaten for a day and a half. And so I got Whitaker, my bosun mate first class in my division. I was by then fourth division officer in five inch. And I got him to take him, believe it or not, down to the chief's mess on the second deck down in the almost in the fan tail. It was the best food aboard that ship. Chiefs ate much better than any, maybe not better than the animals. So we took him down there. And then, out on the, out on the water, showed a destroyer coming at flank speed with almost a fantail, like a, with Mr. That I have my picture on um, the Buchanan. He was the uh, lieutenant, officer of the deck of the Buchanan that brought MacArthur aboard. Oh, okay. I'm so sorry. And he he was coming 38 knots when we saw him, 10 miles away. Oh, this destroyer. And he came and went to reversed engines on the port side and pushing it and he backed this destroyer. He came right at the Missouri and backed this thing around and popped against this spar. I have never seen such seamanship in my life. And I told him that this is the day of the 50th anniversary because I was telling this story that I just told you in the bus going from the ferry boat over to Bremerton, where the ship was. And this man, three rows ahead of me, I didn't know the name of the destroyer, I, he said, that was me. And we had the jolliest, most wonderful oh, time wow. uh, that day. Uh, and uh, one, one little thing, I uh, did my duty on the port side, and General MacArthur was the next to come, as I just told you, and I was relieved uh, as the officer of the deck and our uh, executive officer became officer of the deck to greet General MacArthur. He's a, that's the proper thing. Where, uh, where were you standing then when all the ceremony was going on? Right. One funny thing that happened. Every, the, the Admiral Nimitz and Halsey had uh, everybody all uh, set with the admirals the admirals all in front. MacArthur came aboard, and all of a sudden some adjutant individual came out, and all the generals were up in front. This changed this whole thing. Yeah. Oh yeah, the other picture. Here's, here's he coming, and here's all our guys. And here, they were, now they're all up here. I'm right here. Oh. I was taller than some of the guys, and I could see over, right there. And there's another picture where it's easy to tell who I am. But the astonishing thing, I think, was not only the flyby by the baby planes and whatever planes over, overhead, but the care uh, with which, in my judgment, uh, 
General MacArthur treated to General uh, Wainwright and General Percival, the two guys that had been uh, incarcerated since the Corregidor in Singapore. He was more than thoughtful in his treatment of them, I thought. And uh, will General Wainwright and General Percival please uh, accompany me while I sign? And they marched up and stood behind him. And then each of them got a uh, he got one of the pens that he used. Well, then all the foreign people, the Russians, there's General MacArthur talking there. And then... Uh, now these photographs that you have... Yeah, I'm sorry, I no, 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 copies no. made. No, I no, no, I'll make copies, that's no problem. What I was wondering is where did they come from? Are they... Uh, Stanley Kirkhoff who was the photographic officer of the USS Missouri, a lieutenant from the state of Missouri, K-E-R-K-H-O-F, Kirkhoff, gave me copies of these. And night, they're all, say, confidential, on the back they say, confidential USS Missouri. And what a nifty, now for instance, this is the flag that Admiral Perry flew over on his ship when he went into Tokyo. Oh, in 18, I mean, whatever the Perry, hell yeah. And, uh, and so Stan Kirkhoff gave me all these, gave me some beautiful big blow-ups that I think Timothy had. No, this is what he had. A, a very interesting guy, a very studious guy. And uh, had a whole, uh, then he had a, an assistant who was a uh, guy who worked in the post office. You know, we had a post office for 3,000 people aboard the ship, and he was the guy who, uh, and this is where I am, right there. But, so, you know, give me a break. It was uh, <laughs> something that, uh, the only one kind of funny sideline. After I'd been relieved of my job on the port side, uh, I was standing with my little thing on, over to see if uh, near where the uh, gentlemen from the various countries were. And uh, I wanted to talk to some of the press people from uh, various countries, uh, mostly France if I could, and China if I could. And Captain Murray, our skipper, came by and said, uh, Mr. Harvard, I said, yes sir, do you have a pair of regulation Navy shoes? And I said, yes sir. You suppose you could go put them on? I had on my Saks Fifth Avenue loafers. <laughs> no tassels or anything, just yeah. plain moccasins, you know, which were <laughs> ten times more comfortable. And I said, yes, sir. So <laughs> up I went, and uh, on my way down, I went up inside the inside the uh, tower, the uh, mast, as they called it, the big thing, on the six level, as I said, and I came um, outboard, and on the old five level was the flybridge. And then the, the old four level and old five level were the, uh, the conning tower, the thing with 22 inches of steel, you know, on the door, the, the 17 times. And as I walked by on the old four level, where the bridge was and the cutting tower was inside it. A oh, flash of light. And I remember walking back to the position because I was making my way down the ladders quickly. You could slide down the whole way in those days. And to where I'd seen the flash, and there it was again. So I went to the door of this cutting tower, which was two thirds open. Things that thick steel. And here are two of these Russian guys that come along with little things like Minox cameras, standing in the center, moving like this, moving around, taking pictures. Well, I beat it out and went down the outboard ladder, down got to Captain Murray. He looked at I said, No, sir, there are people taking pictures in the conning tower. And he got Sergeant.
the Marine Sergeant, who was just a fantastic guy. And the Marine Sergeant, the uh, the fellow who was the, the main guy of like a like a shore patrol policeman aboard ship. This guy, he was a master warrant officer. And they went up and marched these guys out, took their cameras and took them down to the motor whale boat down off the starboard side, down the accommodation ladder, and put them off the ship. As I said in the screenplay that I wrote called The Big Mo, whether anybody knew it, and I'm sure they all knew it, the Cold War started on September 2nd, 1945. And it started after in Berlin or any place else it started out there. And uh interview with Ted Harvard today. And we're down here. Uh, this, Ted, you say this is the This is the Wisconsin. Wisconsin. Just but it's an Iowa class like Iowa the class. Uh, Missouri. Oh, yeah. Almost identical. Just a couple of tiny changes. But let's, you looked at this picture here. Now, what's this picture down here? This picture here is, of, of course, of Admiral Nimitz signing for the United States with General MacArthur and General and Admiral Halsey and Admiral, I think, uh, I think it's, uh, what's his name's father, uh, John McCain's father or oh, grandfather? Yeah, McCain's, uh -huh. Admiral yeah. McCain, who was our battleship admiral right. at that time. And here is, <laughs> you're a willing participant in this. <laughs> J.G. Edward Harvard behind the admirals, because oh, I yes. brought aboard uh, most of the, or a number of the uh, uh, foreign dignitaries, and right. had been officer of the deck on the port side, yeah. where we had the accommodation ladder from the spar down below to bring all these people uh, aboard. Only the Japanese representatives came aboard on the starboard side. Oh. The Russians wanted to come in there, but Admiral Holly said, no more there. Point to that handsome guy again. <laughs> The 172-pound version. Oh, yes. Right in the back row there? Right in the back row. Okay. Actually, I was standing up on a little parapet that went up towards turret, uh, turret 2. Yeah. This is on the old one level, the first level above the main deck. Okay. And uh, back up in here, of course, our admiral's quarters on the O2 level, where General MacArthur had a little party after the uh, ceremony. Uh -huh. Wow. The bad duty was when you were underway was to be stationed back here, and that was on Sky Two, Sky Four, because the actually the chicken feathers they would be burning off the chickens, yeah, and to serve for dinner <laughs> would burn up through here, and it was just the most terrible smell. Everybody was back here was ahead. And here is the the uh, after uh, main battery director. That was the radar that controlled this turret here. And this turret, these, of course, we, we lost uh, Lieutenant J.G. Uh, Fotheringill, who was uh, in this, and we tried to bring it back aboard after it was really on this a test uh -huh. run, the two uh, seaplanes. And back here, this crane came around and went, it, and for some reason, the, the crane swung and swung the, the aircraft into the port side of the fantail oh. and it went down and we never got to Mr. Father and go. Oh, I wasn't, didn't see it, I was up here at the time. Uh -huh. So where was your uh, duty right. station? Well, Battle I station? started, when I started in, in the very, very beginning, I was in this uh, 40 millimeter quad mount. That's uh, a, that what we call the pom-pom gun set? Yeah, boom, 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 like this. And, then I and that would rotate around? And that, that one will go all the way up to about, oh, about 360, 340, 350. It would not shoot over the bow, because we had other gun emplacements up there. Right. Okay. Yeah. And then I was moved from there to Sky 2, and I was the Sky 2 assistant uh, director, uh, director officer. Uh -huh. Jack Wiggins was my boss. He was sat up there, and I sat back in here. And you directed, what, five inches? Which five three, inches, what, these those three. Ones this, down this, down this. Two, four, and six. Correct. Except in condition three, when we were just sailing and didn't expect any immediate action, <coughs> this director 
uh, was out of play entirely, as was number three. One took all the five-inch mounts on the starboard side, and four took all the five-inch mounts on the port side. I don't remember the motor whale boats, but I'm sure they were there. We had we had 20 quads and 80 20 millimeter. These are these guns here, mm -hmm. 80 20 millimeter oh, guns. Okay. A one man did it, and it went on in a round. We we'll probably have them on there. Well, yeah, it was a round cylind cylindrical thing which had 60 some 20 millimeter rounds in it went around like this and fed these guns. On the other side, right about here, is where the kamikaze hit us on, uh, I guess it was April 11th, the bad day. And uh, but astonishingly though, uh, you see this with the teak wood decks, which we talked about earlier. Yes. Uh, they were all painted gray in a semi, uh, I guess, just to correspond to that. Yeah. And in the minute we left Tokyo Bay, the guys, <laughs> not I think, they started to work on those decks. And what a workout. They had oh. these pumice stones, weighed about 18 or 20 pounds, with a with a, a large rod in them. It was wooden. And I can never forget. It was just awful. It was hot as hell. And they would take the, the salt water from, uh, from our pumps and wash this stuff down into the scuppers, then it'd go off. And uh, <laughs> when I was telling you the other day, I don't see the Davids that we lost going through the Panama Canal. We had Davids that went over like, they were farther out than this, that would allow the motor whaleboats to be put oh. into the water. And they, uh -huh. they protruded maybe a foot, foot and a half over the, uh, over the scuppers there, over the, the and those we wore them right off, broke them off going through the canal. <laughs> oh, going through the canal, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the um, those three large guns there. Uh, These are the 16, 16 inch, inches. Huh? Yeah, with a 2,400 pound. They had three different kinds of shells. They had armor piercing, which was the basic shell used. They had. Good. They, on the Iowa or the Wisconsin? The Iowa. What? Great, that was the number one. I'm interrupting you. And we... That was a pretty good job. Well, that's where you were? Oh. Wow. And uh, the... Uh, what was that talking about? Oh, the, the fact of, of the uh, operation that day was that we had... Uh, we had shut down two planes that morning. And this is when the carrier force planes had sunk, sunk the Japanese Yamamoto, Yama, yeah, Yamamoto, Yamamoto. Yamamoto. And all of a sudden, instead of the carriers for, oh, I guess four or five days off Okinawa, we became, the, the battleships became the target for the Japanese kamikazes because we had sunk their uh, major battleships. Mm -hmm. And where were, were you in Sky 2 when the plane hit? I was in Sky 2 when the plane hit. I was right there. The plane hit right over there. Oh. And all we saw was a puff of smoke. We got half of a Japanese aboard. He was cut in half, either by our bullets or by the, uh, probably by the, uh, yeah. the uh, uh, collision with the yeah. ship. But uh, it is, you must say, it is one of the most exquisite vessels ever built of any kind anywhere. And one day, we had a Betty come in at night, one of the bomb, the Japanese bomber types, right. a small bomber types, a two-engine two plane, and it dropped a bomb. We figured about 40 or 50 yards aft of the Missouri, yeah. and it literally lifted the back of the ship, the fan huh. tail of the ship, out of the water. We knew it did because we were, I was in Sky 4 right there. Huh. Boom. And then, uh, then, thank goodness, nothing. We were scared that one of our four propellers mm -hmm. would have been damaged or perhaps rendered inoperative. This is much more, this is the flag hoist from, here's the flybridge I was telling you about. Yeah. Here is the bridge. And in this conning tower here, when you can't see it very, uh -huh. it's in under here. It's where I saw our friends uh, on September 2nd. Oh, yeah. Yes. Oh, so that's where it was. Yeah. The Russians that were yeah. doing stuff.
Point to show me that again. Where was that? Right. Well, as you came down this ladder in Sky One, you come around this. It's circling. Yeah. Well, there's a ladder or something. I just don't see it. Yeah. Goes from here down yeah, to here. Yeah, I see it. I see it. And we go in here. And this was, was where the uh, that 22 inches of steel was. And we're showing the Battle of Iwo Jima and the Buddy Rogers Wings Theater. Everyone is invited to attend. So where were you in Tokyo Bay then? Where were you? In you Tokyo guys Bay, where right? Did you all well, stand then first, during the morning time, I was right here. We had, as I said, an accommodation ladder that went here and then down to here to a spar, yeah. which was about 35 feet wide and 12, 15 feet deep, where the various vessels bringing the uh, foreign dignitaries and then eventually General MacArthur. What do you call that? A, a spar, S-P-A-R. Which it's, means? It's, a, it's a wooden raft is what it is. Oh, uh -huh. That's what they call it. And, and then they would have a ladder or something? Would you know, it, was a, it was a stairway. Oh, I see. It wasn't a ladder this way, which is no, a stairway, stairway called an I accommodation see. ladder. Uh -huh. In fact, that was what we had when President and Mrs. Truman came aboard on Navy Day in 1945 oh, in the yeah. Hudson River. Yeah. But I was right here receiving the uh, salutes and welcoming aboard the various individuals. And that's when I told you the story about uh, General Leclerc oh, okay. from France. All right. Bienvenue, mon général. Oh, how terribly nice of you to have yeah. <laughs> And so they would come through here. Yeah. Here. And up this, up this ladder. Well, there's a better ladder than that. It once again was a stairway. Uh -huh. Over here, up to the O, one level where the surrender was going to be signed, which was, well, that was it. I'm not sure how that is. These were just, these were the the telescopic controls, in case we lost the main battery radar uh, for, uh, for turret one and turret one and turret two, then they could uh, work by, uh, by visual. See, how you see 16 miles, I don't know, but we <laughs> could shoot up to about 22 miles, fire yeah. those shells. Uh, and oh, during the hurricane, I have a wonderful <coughs> picture of it at home. During the hurricane, when we lost a destroyer, you could see its red uh, uh, turned upside down. And yeah. We had a sailor. They, they lost 208 guys. We had a sailor washed aboard Missouri in these enormous things. And he uh. hit this. He hit uh, yeah, the 40 millimeter. He hit there. And they sent a crew right up from sick bay and grabbed him took him below, down through this, well, here's the wardroom here, it was down mm -hmm. through a, lot, a uh, ladder going below there to the uh, third deck where the sick bay was. The only guy to survive that particular. Wow. So that, uh, that sub, sub, that was a, was that a? A Jack destroyer. A, I mean, oh, that was. That we lost, we oh, lost, we lost, a, we oh, lost oh, a, in the, the destroyer in the hurricane. Oh, wow. Yeah. And that was the only guy that survived? That's the only guy that survived that we knew anything about. Unbelievable, it was really broken up in pieces when he, with this enormous wave. The waves were breaking all the way up to here. I was sitting up here in the captain's chair. It was a beautiful big leather chair, huge. And I would put on my rain gear and sit up there when I was off. And it, it was just fantastic. It was gorgeous storm you ever saw. If there was a perfect storm, that was it. Yeah. <laughs> so, so where did everybody stand then during the ceremony? On the, the other ceremony? side, on the starboard on the other side. side just right there. Right. This, this side, would be like that, that side, yeah, over on the other side. Identical. Yeah. yeah. And uh, this is a little bit modified, frankly, David, from uh, the Missouri, because we had, well, we had more room to go through there. But the point being that they had, what they had was uh, about 160 general officers of the then Army Air Force the admirals of the Navy, a few Marine generals, and then, of course, the Army generals, MacArthur's. Mm -hmm. And as I showed you here, when General MacArthur came aboard, we had all the admirals lined up closest to the dignitaries, which we figured would have more photographic coverage. As you can see, <laughs> they got mo moved. So the, here were all the press was up here behind the thing. And he put all the generals, the army generals, moved them, just shifted them out so they'd be in a perfect line of bearing. From that. Uh, 
by the way, folks, this gentleman here is Ted Harbert, and he was on the Missouri, and that's him right there, right there. Wow. You were an officer on the Missouri? Yeah, I was. That's uh, from the commissioning detail on through Tokyo Bay, and then into. Uh, I didn't have to go to Turkey, and I got out on March. 3rd, 1946, and on March 4th they left Norfolk, Virginia and took the Turkish ambassador who had died in office in Washington <laughs> back to Turkey. What a good trip to miss that was. Great. Well, I can't help but that. So you were on board when they signed the uh, surrender with the Japanese? Yep, that was what, that's Admiral Nimitz signing Nimitz? for the United States right there, Admiral Halsey. I think that's, uh, I think that's Senator McCain's grandfather. Mm -hmm. He was our, what they called our, our battleship admiral, Admiral okay. McCain. And there's MacArthur. Right. Here's the Dutch plenipotentiary. He flew from Holland to around the back way to get to, and he wanted to land on the Yokosuka Naval Air Station, uh, the Japanese air station, but the General MacArthur said nobody lands there until we that's wonderful, the politics of, yeah. uh, of battle. So how long did you serve on the, on the Missouri? The whole time from, I started in June of 1944, June 4th, pre-commissioning detail in Newport, Rhode Island. Okay, Ted, yeah, that was, I really enjoyed uh, you going over the, uh, the model. That was a, I've seen models this big, but never anything like that. Aren't they Although I'd seen that down there before when I was here, but I didn't have a chance to study it. Yeah, great. Wonderful. I think the last time we were just about the time when you were getting out. That's so correct. why don't we? Uh, do you have anything else you want to add as far as your uh, years in the service? Uh? I wanted to make a point, most specifically about the extraordinary, I, I would say, um, courtesy of the um, of the personnel on the other vessels. When you consider that we got out there, we're the last, for all practical purposes, capital ship to get to the war zone, at least in our size, although the Bonhomme Richard, the big carrier, came after uh, we did uh, a few months. Uh, you would think people would have been jealous and uh, angry that so much attention was lavished on the Missouri. I never heard a single solitary word, neither there in Tokyo Bay, where we didn't have much uh, capacity to uh, interact, but at Guam we did, and they were perfectly delightful to us. At Hawaii, in in Pearl Harbor, we did on our way back during in the Panama Canal transit, people would come up and would come aboard. It was delightful. Both our uh, military, usually not Navy, uh, there were some Air Force and some Army people there, Army Air Force and Air Army people, and then again at Norfolk, which is the first U.S. port we hit. Other than Pacific, and uh, and on through Navy Day in the, the Hudson River in New York, I will say there was some certain amusement on some of the fellows that had been working the Atlantic shift in that awful weather, when we would go into um, uh, go into a bar or a hotel. The Astor Hotel was very popular at that time, and we had these cards, which I will show you. I should have brought today, but I didn't. These cards that identified our presence at the, uh, the surrender, and we had showed to people, and that was good for a free drink any place in, <laughs> in New York. But the, at, the, at the surrender, about that card, as uh, I said, being one of the officer escorts, I was given a packet of them, who knows, 100 or 150, passed out one or two to each of the uh, U.S. Uh, 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 top military people. And General LeMay, Curtis LeMay, said, hey, kid, give me a, a couple of dozen of those. I got some friends. I said, well, General, I, did, I frankly didn't know who he was. I learned very quickly. Um, General, I've been told that it's one or two uh, per person. And I, uh, the, he said, look, go back to your boss and tell him that Kurt LeMay wants a couple dozen goddamn cards. And I said, yes, sir. <laughs> General LeMay gave him a pack of them. <laughs> uh, and, and he was fun. And, and, and of course, the it was interesting, kind of the, let's say, the, the class distinction. Uh, who was invited to General MacArthur and Admiral Nimitz's little party up in Admiral's country on the O2 level after the ceremony of the uh, thing? Uh, 
Sir Bruce Fra Admiral Sir Bruce Fraser, who was aboard the KG-5 uh, in company with us, uh, was was you know, up there. General LeMay, of course Halsey, and Admiral McCain and, Je and Admiral Nimitz, and he had taken over Halsey's quarters on the O2 level of the Missouri for that day. And uh, <clears throat> not all of the foreign dignitaries uh, were invited, and certainly none of the Russians were invited. That was made very clear. In fact, they, as I told you earlier of my experience <clears throat> with the two Russian photographers in our conning tower, uh, I believe Captain Murray, our skipper, uh, was invited and went up there. And whether he told that story or not, I don't know. All I know, and I did remember the name of the sergeant whom I wanted to mention when I was speaking, it was Sergeant Drumheller, spelled exactly as it sounds. And that is the toughest human being I have ever met in my life. I would love to have him in a, on my side in any fight. He was terrific. Yeah. Uh, at, the, at the end of the ceremony, uh, it was when, as I told you about that bottle of Shenley's Black Death that Marna had uh, smuggled aboard the Missouri at San Francisco. We opened that up and uh, enjoyed ourselves, four or five of us up, because I'd gotten my stateroom back as being a junior grade lieutenant now. And it was, a, it was an extraordinary, extraordinary evening. Uh, and uh, I don't know if we talked about this or before, but the Missouri was chosen because I think it's a ball-faced fact that President Truman was in uh, as, uh, when President Roosevelt uh, died, and he, uh, oh, a, a sideline, David Truman, a seaman second class, President Truman's nephew, was aboard the USS Missouri. I don't know what he did, uh, I don't know what, but he was a seaman second class. And so one day, he came up to me, and I can't remember, I thought I was watching Admiral Halsey play that deck tennis game. Uh -huh. And he said, Mr. Harbor, could I see you for a minute? And I said, sure, and I wasn't sure who he was. And he said, I'm David Truman. I said, yeah, David. And we went aft of there, along to where the the, uh, the entry to the, to the main wardroom was. And he said, I've got a couple of letters that I want to write to my uncle. And uh, and I don't want to have them go just through that regular suit. The junior officers would get down in a junior officer mess down there and have 5,000 letters that we would have to peruse, go over, and then uh, sign our initials on them that they had passed the censorship. And I said, well, David, uh, would you tell me what's in the letters? I'll be happy to accommodate you. And he, or whatever fancy word I said. And he said, well, I'm just telling him how everybody's nice here and nobody hates me because I'm his nephew. Uh -huh. And I said, that's a very good reason. Let's send those letters. So I signed them. And then he would bring them to me every, well, maybe once or twice again to his uncle, the president, but to, to his mother and to others. Nice young man. Uh, had as sharp features as President Truman did. Dark, very dark hair. Um, but, you know, this the passing parade snapshots of life aboard a capital vessel in wartime. I believe I told you last time, David, that uh, I was lucky to get out when I did before the ship went to Turkey because of uh, Hap Flanagan's, the, the, pre the chairman of uh, Manufacturers Hanover's Trust, brother, was an admiral, and I had had uh, supper with him, uh, with Marna, at the Flanagan's in White Plains, New York. And he said, well, what are you going to get out? You're married now or anything else? I said, well, with my points, it looks like it's going to be uh, late April, early May. And he said, uh, well, I said, isn't that ship going someplace? Are you going to go with it? And I said, I told him about the turkey trip. And he said, well, we can do something about that. And sure enough, when I went back that, uh, that week to, and we were at Norfolk, Virginia, uh, getting ready to take aboard the catafalque of the uh, of the Turkish ambassador. Along came orders for Ensign Harbor to uh, Lieutenant Junior Grade Harbor to report to operations at Cherry Something Base there in Norfolk. Uh -huh. I went over and I got my what, got my terminal leave pay and a little 
ruptured duck, that little gold insignia for people who served. And all of a sudden I was uh, out of the service and on my way. Uh, and uh, <coughs> that was uh, in and of itself a delight. We flew to who, us. Who, who was the fellow you think that arranged that? Admiral Flanagan. F-L-A-N-I-G-A-N. His nephew, Peter Flanagan, was Richard Nixon's uh, counsel. Like, uh, well, he was, had a better office than, uh, than John Dean, the uh, other lawyer, so I know he must have been pretty important. It was his brother, or did you say it was, it was No, he, he was, Admiral Flanagan was the brother of the chairman of Manufacturers Hanover, and Peter Flanagan was Hap Flanagan's son, therefore Admiral Flanagan's nephew. And uh, he was, uh, you know, whatever else, uh, my kind of guy. I think he was in the Air Force, but I can't remember. So now, okay, you're out. So what are you thinking about doing? We went. I went back to New York, and uh, I had told you about Mr. Mayor, L.B. Mayor, being aboard the Missouri when we were <coughs> in uh, Pier 90 at uh, on the uh, Hudson River. And uh, extraordinary old man, and we ran all over that ship. He wanted to see everything, and he said, "What do you want to do?" And I told him I'd be. I had worked at MGM as an office boy between high school and college in 1941. He said, why don't you come see me? I want to go back in that business? And I said, I'd really like to. So I went uh, to New York. Martin and I got a uh, terminal leave airplane ticket to fly. And we flew from Newark to Memphis, Tennessee, six stops seven stops going across to Los Angeles. Well, let me tell you, um, it was extraordinary. There was, of course, no place to live in Southern California because everybody who had ever gone through, as you well know, being here, wanted to come back to uh, the Los Angeles area. So we uh, moved in with my mother and my sister on Queens Road, right above Ciro's, the nightclub on uh, the Sunset Strip, as they called, and uh, went out every day and evening to look for a place to live. And it was very difficult, and it's a dull, boring story, and we don't need to go into it anymore. We finally got a little house on South 1817 Southwestern Avenue between a beanery and a used car lot, <laughs> and it was th the floor t tilted at least 15 or 20 degrees, and Mara was about to have our first child, Michael, who is now 54. And so it wasn't the most pleasant time in the world, but I did go to uh, see, uh, oh no, I'm sorry. Just before we went there, we went home to Piedmont, California, and I went to Berkeley because we had been told, as I said in our earlier discussion, that once if we would take our commissions early, we, when we returned from the war, they would, quote, take care of us, unquote. I thought that meant since I was only 14 units of work away from 120 for graduation from Berkeley, the big us are, oh no, Mr. Magoo. No, they discussed that and uh, said, no, out of your 62 members of that Naval ROTC class, one was killed. Don Norse, who became a SEAL, one of the first SEALs, brilliant swimmer. He was a water polo player, and he was killed at uh, Peleliu or someplace like that. I'm not sure. And the other 60 were coming back, and me. But, so they said, everybody is coming back to college to finish up their degree, and we expect you to do the same. I said, I wouldn't come back here. I have a job at MGM. Why would I want to come here? And, uh, a sidelight. Over the years, since 1946, there have been two or three attempts I made to be given my degree in political science and English. First was in 1970, uh, 1990. We were, Martin and I had an apartment on, uh, on the beach at uh, Santa Monica. And in the New York Times, which I had been working for for many years, there was an article on the front page of the second section of the National Edition, which identified the fact that the University of California, Berkeley, 
was going to award degrees to 17 Japanese ladies, now in their 60s and 70s, who had been incarcerated in the camps during World War II and hadn't been able to complete their education. Well, as you might guess, that really set me off. And I wrote a letter to the provost of the University of California, to the Academic Senate of the University of California, suggesting that as this was to be my, well, this was 1993, of course, my 70th year, my, my birthday, my 70th birthday, wouldn't it be a wonderful gesture on their part to include me in the ceremony with <laughs> loathing, in fear of loathing at Berkeley, the 17 Japanese ladies who get my degree. Well, they assigned this to a young man with a very strange and exotic name, must have been Thai or something. Well, uh, um, Bufflip, a long name. A very pleasant fellow on the phone. Said, well, we're taking this through the academic center. You realize, of course, Mr. Arbeth, that you were not the best student that we had at Berkeley during your time. I said, yes, I know that. But, he said, we'll try. Uh, it was turned out by the Academic Senate. Then, on my 75th birthday in 1998, my darling sons, five of them, most of them are incredibly successful professionally and personally and certainly financially, tried to buy my degree from the University of California. And the academic senate turned them down and said, he's been through here before and we don't want nothing to do with it. So, the heck with the University of California, what, what would they know? Uh, but, uh, so I went to work at MGM as a uh, assistant press agent publicist, they call it, to try to dignify the, uh, the uh, name, and uh, at uh, Washington Boulevard in Culver City, and immediately was assigned uh, to work with uh, uh, a lady who was head of the uh, magazine, the Movie Stars Parade, Modern Screen, to try to get stories about MGM uh, players in their uh, magazines. And so my first uh, foray in that was a charming one. I took Jimmy Durante and a writer from the Chicago uh, Tribune to lunch at Mike Romanoff's. I believe it was on Beverly Drive. It might have been Rodeo Drive in Beverly Hills. And I had gotten an advance of $50 from the company. There were no credit cards in those days. And I didn't have a house account at Romanoff's. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, the bill came to $47 because our Chicago Tribune reporter ordered a bottle of $17 wine or something. And so, leaving from my $50, maybe the six bucks I had of my own in my pocket, the tip was going to be hardly up to the standards that the waiting force at Romanoff's expected. So I said, there's probably no way in the world to handle this and not be mortified or thrown out on the, on the tarmac. I said to Jimmy Durante, I said, you know a crazy thing? I didn't realize how much it would cost to, to eat here. And I have about $56 and the bill is $48. Do you think that's enough tip? And he said, that's too much for them. Let's get out and get out of here. He and me didn't like the service. Delightful fellow. So we drove home in my funny old car to his house, and the the uh, discussion, the interview continued. And uh, if there were ever any better way to be initiated into the world of uh, motion picture uh, publicity, Jimmy Durante certainly. Uh, and he came to my. He came. So to was he just like you expect him to be when you talk to this? Just like uh, exactly. It's just a uh, just like down to earth. Just like talking to Dr. David Thompson, just to look him straight in the eye, tell him what to think, and it's just wonderful. And he came to my to my uh, rescue 
A number of years later, I was working on a picture called It Happened in Brooklyn. Frank Sinatra, Catherine Grayson, Peter Lawford, and Jimmy Durante. Okay, what was the name of it? Uh, it, yeah. Ha yeah, it Happened in Brooklyn. And I had now been uh, either promoted or moved over to the publicity art department, and I was in charge of having the photographers shoot the advertising art, you know, the things that went on the big billboards, on the 24 sheets or the three sheets, those things you saw in, under glass outside of theaters. Still see them occasionally. Um, and so we... Uh, the art for publicizing the movie? The you know? advertising oh. for it, the advertising art, right. Okay. And so <clears throat> the general uh, routine was to do this the morning after the uh, film wound up after the, the cast party to finish the movie. And so this was two or three days before that, and I went into Frank Sinatra's dressing room. He borrowed Clark Gables and a beautiful wooden patina inside, gorgeously decorated. And he thought he was going to become the next Red Skeleton. He bought about $500 worth of art material, supplies, small canvases, larger canvases of 50 brushes and a bunch of paints and a thing and a board and, and I said Frank we're going to do the uh, the posters which was the terminology tomorrow morning at nine o'clock I'll have you out of here in a half hour he said you're not going to have me in here so you're not going to have me out of here in a half hour so forget it Teddy get lost and I said well you know it's all part of the deal and part of the contract we have to have him. And he said well I'll tell you what Benny Thaw, who was the head of talent at MGM, of whom I'd spoken earlier with, in connection with Judy Garland and the trip down to Palm Springs. He said, I want to use the, the songs from this show, he called it, on my CBS Chesterfield, or whatever the heck the advertiser was, radio show. And they tell me I can't do it until the movie is released. That was pretty generally the way they did it. They tried to make a big splash on the thing. And I said, well, that really has nothing to do with me. It has everything to do with the fact that uh, contractually we uh, have to do the, and I'll get you out of here in a half an hour. And he made a rude suggestion of what I could do with the posters and what I could do with Betty Thaw and what have you. So I went outside, I was taking it back because he'd always been very decent with me. He wasn't mad at me, he was mad at the studio. So I saw Mr. Durante and I said, Jim, let me tell you a funny thing that just happened. I told him what I just told you. And he went into Frank's dressing room without a knock. He said, Hey, Frank, you can't do that to Teddy. That's not his fault. Go upstairs if you want the big boys. And Frank, he said, Did you go? Can I said, You're darn right. Who else would you like me to bring in here? I've got to get these things done. And he said, Oh, shoot. Okay. <laughs> Half an hour, he said. I'm sure not get him out of there in 25 minutes. But Durante, just did things like that. If somebody needed something, you could count on him being front and center. And a nifty, nifty guy. And of course, so when you're in that business, they, the younger actors, I would, every publicist had a list on the page of the actors and actresses uh, for whom you were responsible getting them into fan magazines, into Luella Parsons or Hedda Hopper or Paris and Carol or on the radio or something. And so I had a, not a good list. I had uh, Peter Lawford, who was terribly fond of Marna and used to love to see her. Jane Powell, who was a singer, young singer. Uh, Elizabeth Taylor, who was becoming a beautiful young ingenue at six, age of 16, 15, 16. Claude Jarman Jr., who had been in uh, The Yearling in 1946, and later ran the, uh, helped run the uh, Palm Springs Film uh, uh, Show, Film uh, Exposition. Festival? Uh, film Festival. Oh, yeah? Correct. Yeah. And then moved to San Francisco, did the one up there. Uh, Lassie was on my list, probably not. Heard. Mario Lanza, perfectly, that you're, you've passed away, Mr. Lanza, I can say that you were just a extraordinarily bad person. You were mean to people, and there's no need to be that way. And so, uh, when you have this list of people, and your 
your job was to get them publicity. It was fun to have people like Elizabeth and Peter Luffin because all the magazines wanted to know about so them. So they were, you were, you were the, the person that got their publicity, I mean, they were... Yeah, I, mean, I would... So, like, at the studio would have how many people like you with different There were stars? 27 publicists in the department. Yeah. Uh, three boss types, uh, Howard Strickling, Ralph Wheelwright, and Eddie Lawrence, and then a whole bunch of... And, and then senior publicists, and then, as I was when I began, a junior publicist, less, less important uh, people. But... The interesting thing was, in the in this explosion of entertainment after, just after World War II and just before television, uh, the many young people at the MGM were very kind and generous to Marna and me. They loved Marna because, for instance, Elizabeth dressed very awkwardly with dirndl skirts and those peasant blouses and stuff like that. And Jane Powell was badly dressed by her mother or whoever. So Marna took them both to Magnus over on Wilshire Boulevard. And uh, for one of them, I don't know whether it was Jane or Elizabeth, she charged our charge account. We had a house account there. So for, oh, I'd say a half a dozen or six different outfits or whatever it was. And... Uh, it was just wonderful because Elizabeth wore a, one of the new ensembles to a party we had. And then <clears throat> from that party grew a wonderful Hollywood tradition for many years. It was called the Baby Hospital, not Children's Hospital, the Baby Hospital. Thing. And they would run a kind of a carnival each year out on some tennis location. The one I remember best was in Riviera. And Marna and I uh, got, Marna was kind of running the thing, got Jane Powell and Mario Lanza to sing. We got Peter Lawford and Mickey Rooney to play mixed doubles with Helen Mills and Helen Jacobs. Oh, wow. Now let me tell you, that was re on, a, on a clay court, very few clay courts, it's like a, on a clay court out there. And it was, I mean, people literally came and paid money just to see that. Uh, Elizabeth and Pier Angeli, an Italian actress who later married Vic Damone, whom I introduced her to, bad planning on Ted's part. And um, they sang, oh no, they were going to sell kisses. Well, after the first half hour, hour, whatever it was, a Saturday afternoon, Mark and he says, look over there. And nobody was playing our various games. They were lined up for these kisses. And that, Rick, so I can't remember what happened, but I know we pulled them out of there and didn't do that anymore. Uh, those things. And so we were very fortunate. People were very kind to us. We had great friends in uh, Ricardo and Georgiana Montalban, uh, Jimmy and Nancy Whitmore. Um, uh, the others that I've mentioned, and then the Jean Hagen and her husband, who was a producer. And I got asked to play on Gene Kelly's volleyball team on Sundays in his backyard. And that's where we kind of found that there was a certain schism in political attitudes, because, well, I had worked, this was 1950, skipping ahead a little bit, 1950, I had worked for Richard Nixon in the uh, Brentwood precinct, uh, who was running against Helen Gehagen Douglas for the Senate. And I was working on a picture called Crisis. I may have mentioned this earlier, but I don't, don't think so. Uh, Crisis uh, with Cary Grant, Jose Ferrer, and Melvin Douglas. It was a story about a doctor who refused to treat a South American dictator played by Jose Ferrer until he let somebody go or whatever the storyline was. And Melvin Douglas, who was a perfectly charming gentleman, used to do jokes about his wife, 
that she would eat three bowls of Wheaties every morning with honey on them. And so I tried to, being a turncoat, to use that to give Richard Nixon some stuff, funny stuff, because Richard Nixon was about as funny as that wastepaper basket. That guy's personality and sense of humor just didn't expand. So Mr. Mayor at MGM and his his kind of political amanuensis helper at the studio, whose name I will come up with any minute, would send me out only three or four times in that total period to try to help Nixon take four by five cards with the big print of these jokes on them and hope that he would say them properly. So I wrote two or three of them about what Mr. Douglas had said about his wife, Helen Gahagan, and put them on these things. And I went out to the Pomona, Los Angeles County Fair. Well, there was a big crowd on. Nixon was supposed to make the speech. You know, he just, he just perspired. It, oh, perspired is not um, awful enough. He sweated blood before those unplanned personal appearances. Not when it was to make a speech. I'm sure he was very cool and methodical. But boy, in front of a mob of people that he didn't know, that was tough work. So I was in this kind of a, well, it was kind of a forerunner of a van, I guess, of an automobile van now. But we were in this thing. And I gave him these three four by five cars and big printing. And I said, she, she is such an unusual woman. She eats three bowls of Wheaties every morning with honey on them. And he looked at me. <laughs> and he just stared at me. <laughs> oh, and, the, and then, and then what happens? And I said, well, if you say that, you, there's nothing wrong with the Helen Gagan devil. This is the three bowls of Wheaties. I didn't want to forget. I said, you know, like the old bump in the burlesque. And he looked at me. He said, burlesque what? And I said, well, if you can do this, Mr. Nixon. He didn't do it. He had a card right there. Try to come up. So anyway, we had these probably a little too social a life to be as hard working as we were supposed to be. Because people was like, were nice to us and they came came to our house. We had a little teeny house that was new, but a little teeny house compared to their houses and what have you, but they would come. And that's when I started to cook. And we'd cook and uh, have fun. In fact, Nick and, and Nick Hilton and, and I and I introduced Nick to Elizabeth because I played golf with him a couple times up at Bel Air. He was a hell of a player, that's fine golfer. Also a fine drinker, unfortunately. And uh, so I invited right after I had invited him to come to Elizabeth's 16th birthday party. She was going out with a fellow by the name of Glenn Davis, who was a football player for the Army, and the, coming to the L.A. Rams, or was already on the Rams or something. I'm not positive about that part of it. Glenn was a nice enough fellow, but gee whiz, he, he must have taken Richard Nixon pills every morning, because boy, nothing really happened there in the, in the personality department. And then he went to work for the Los Angeles Times for many, many years, running their uh, uh, athletic uh, sponsorships and involvements, what have you. And I heard he's a delightful fellow. Never saw him again. And so Nick saw Elizabeth Taylor and he said, my God. I mean, there is no question. That was the most exquisite thing that was walking around on two feet in the early 1950s, late 40s. It's just incredible. In fact, I had a job, and I may, if I said this before, please stop me. Uh, oh. If Elizabeth was at the studio, she'd have to go to school down at the MGM schoolhouse. And so I would go down around 12, five minutes after 12, pick her up and take her to lunch. The idea was to make sure that somebody else didn't pick her up and take her to lunch, I think. But that was my job. And I may have signed myself onto that job rather than being directed to do it. And so I would go down, pick her, and we'd walk up to the commissary, the MGM commissary, and walk by himself. Robert Taylor, very handsome, older fellow, went by and he said, hey, how do you come to 
come over here a minute. And uh, he said, you know that new LaSalle convertible I have? And I said, they're beautiful. It was brilliant. It was the first of the racing green uh, convertible U.S. cars I ever saw. And he said, if you'd like to use it for uh, uh, this weekend, why don't you bring uh, that little girl of yours over to eat lunch with us? Well, he'd sat at the producer's table at MGM. Mr. Gable sat there. Mr. Tracy, whenever he came in there, which was very so, sat there. And the producers, various and sundry. And so I said, I think that would just be a terrific idea. Uh, I'll have to get back to you on it, though, Bob, and I will do so right away. So, of course, we never do that. But Elizabeth and I would always sit at the same little table for two in the far right hand corner of the thing. And that, that day, or the day that I'm remembering, that Bob Taylor said, Catherine Hepburn came in. And she didn't use it. She usually had her lunch served on the, on the set. And so Elizabeth said, oh, My goodness, there's Catherine Hepburn. I've got to get her autograph. And I said, Well, okay, but I really suggest that. Uh, she can be very difficult to deal with, uh, or whatever the heck I said. I can't remember exactly what I said, but I said I would not recommend doing it. I'm sure I can get an autograph. No, no, I want to get it. See, I have this book, and she took out this little leather book that said autographs on it. I'll never forget it. it brown leather, like suede. And she went over three or four tables, and the first thing I heard, get away from me, you little bitch. I'm sorry to put that on the thing. This shouldn't be in this story if it's ever done. But Miss Hepburn was acting like herself and just turned off this pretty little girl. Cold turkey. And Elizabeth came back. She said, did you hear what she said? She said, isn't that a dog? And I said, that's what it is. And I said, I'm sorry, but I told you so. So we would do that. And then when she was really good and got good stuff, this sounds so juvenile. Once every two or three weeks after school, because if she wasn't working, she would work, go to school until three o'clock. I'd pick her up to take her home. I wasn't a, a manservant for the Taylor family. That wasn't it. But the idea was to keep her away from the Red Hots, very frankly, the Lawfords and the Lazes and the what have you, and the Sterling Haydens, who would grab any little girl that came along, uh, literally. And so I would take her home. So what she loved better than anything else was this thing called a Boston cream pie, which they served at a drive-in up on the strip called Dolores's, D-O-L-O-R-E-S, Dolores's. And we drive up there, and so it was, oh, well, right, right, right around her 16th birthday, she would, she got this baby blue Cadillac convertible for her 16th birthday. And I helped teach her to drive, and we got a, a f official drive coach from the MGM um, studio garage. They had these these big black Chryslers that they took people around in. And he taught her to drive. And so we'd drive up there in that car, and sure enough, boy, after she'd been in about two or three pictures, I mean, I'm not talking about National Velvet, I'm talking about Date with Judy and some of these little ingenue parts. Boy, you couldn't drive in there. They would use just stop traffic. And it was astonishing. And all the, the little car hops, the girls, you know, who would serve the pie would come over to talk about well, stars in your eyes. It just was unbelievable. And it, it is. It's a, in 1950, it was a 1948, 49 was a totally different part of the world, and nobody who didn't experience it could ever understand how how hokey, but how realistic it was. That people just were mad about the movie stars. So, so went MGM. Then they got Jane Powell got married first, and I guess May of 1949 to Gary Stephan, and I was a usher in that wedding, and so. Elizabeth got married. Oh, we went to New York for three weeks to get her trousseau. Nick and Sarah Taylor, her mother, S-A-R-A, -A, no H on that Sarah Taylor. Her name had been Sarah Southern, and she had been a Broadway actress in Ingenue and then had some pretty good parts before she married Frances Taylor, C-I-S, 
uh, who was an art dealer, whose, whose uncle, Howard Taylor, was a very important art dealer in New York City and then later in the basement of the Beverly Hills Hotel. Uh, <clears throat> and so we went to New York and uh, went to uh, two nights in a row. We went to see uh, we went to see Southern Pacific with Mary Martin and uh, South and Pacific. South Pacific. Yeah. And uh, and it was just amazing to walk down. Huh? And this was a bigger deal. If I had been Mary Martin, I would have been absolutely furious because during her first soliloquy, her first song. Uh, or I'm as corny as Kansas in August. Amazing. Fifty, sixty calls an hour at the Waldorf Towers. And so what I set up was a Marjorie, I forget the chief operator at the Hill, at the Conrad Hilton owned the Waldorf story, who would pass any, what sound like reasonable phone calls through my room. And boy, that became a, uh, a disaster waiting to happen. So he said, well, I'll, I'll find you going out of the world or tires there and you're in trouble. Oh, fine. So I was a usher in their wedding in uh, 1950, I guess it was May 5th. Something. Where did they get married? At Good Shepherd on uh, Santa Monica Boulevard in uh, Beverly Hills. A Catholic wedding. And uh, was, was it lived with a Catholic family? No. She, I guess there was Nick, some. Nick was? Nick, Nick was. Mr. Hilton was, yeah. And Nick was. And, uh, the wedding was handled by, was performed, the ceremony performed by a pair of Jesuits. Very hot, great speakers. These guys were, I can think of the names on the board. But, so after that we had a, a uh, reception up at the Bel Air Hotel or the Bel Air Country. I guess it was the Bel Air Hotel. Yeah. Joe Drown owned the Bel Air Hotel and he was a uh, uh, he was a friend of Mr. Hilton's and more or less uh, Mr. Hilton had uh, guided his career. And then they took off for honeymoon. And about three weeks later or whatever time later we got a call in the middle. So of she was how old then when she got 18. She was 18 on, I think it's February 28th, and I think she was married on April 5th or something. And how old was he? He was 24. I was, let's see, I am seven years older than she, I don't know more than that. Yeah, it's about seven years, aren't she? So yeah, he was, he was 24. And uh, we got a call in the middle of the night which we'd had many times before, or before she was married, and it was Elizabeth. She said, Teddy, come get me. He hit me again today. I don't know whether I should say this on this. It was a very messy time. Probably it's not pertinent. So they were divorced, and everybody knows the story since then. Well Marna and I stayed at MGM until late 1952. Mr. Hilton hired me to go to Chicago become the assistant director of music and entertainment. This is Conrad Hilton. Conrad Hilton, senior, right. Conrad N. Hilton. And uh, there were entertainment policies, as it was called, in 13. To go to Chicago? To go to Chicago. That was his headquarters uh -huh. at the Palmer House for music and entertainment. And uh, so Baron Hilton, Nick's younger brother, I had become close friends, and I had suggested to him what we ought to do, because NBC was just starting to do remotes in their television uh, experience, and I suggested that it might be useful to try to sell NBC the rights to come into the Hilton Hotel entertainment rooms and either shoot on film, because they didn't have videotape at that time, or shoot live, which they could do. Uh, various and sundry uh, acts, such as, uh, oh, darling, je vous aime beaucoup, the charming French lady who uh, sang constantly, and I'll think of it in heaven, so I shouldn't 
forget that. And, and uh, I told you about George Goble and various acts, comedians, dance acts, the June Taylor dancers in the Palmer House. There were eight gorgeous girls who danced at the Palmer House. And they had wonderful orchestras, the Tommy Dorsey Orchestra, the, the uh, various and sundry orchestras, Dick Hames, the singer Perry Como. They all played the Hilton things because they get these wonderful trips because they, they could also go to Puerto Rico where they own the uh, Carib Hilton in San Juan and play down there. And it was something that, uh, so sure enough, we went to Chicago and lived in a place called Elmhurst, Illinois, some 30 miles west of Chicago. I am positive, except for maybe a couple of mounds at the Rockies, there is nothing between there and the Yukon. Because we got there in November of 1952, <laughs> and I must say, you should have seen, that snow came and never quit. And we had never been in snow before we'd gone to Mount Diablo up in Oakland or to Mount Baldy years, but never on purpose. So that was unbelievable. And so we spent about a year at that, and I found a guy named George Goble, a very mm -hmm. funny young man, working at the uh, Chase Hotel in St. Louis. We hired him to come to the Palmer House, and I called a man I had known briefly in New York, Manny Sachs, that's S-A-C-K-S, who was General Sarnoff's kind of right hand and been head of RCA Records or head of RCA Records recording. And told him that I had found him. So he said, Well yeah, I remember him. He was on Grand Ole Opry for a while. I didn't know that. And so he and a bunch of guys from New York came out to see George Goble opening night in the Palmer House. He did about an hour and a half and absolutely killed the people. And so they hired George Goble to go to uh, to Los Angeles and make uh, TV shows, and blissfully hired me out of the woebegone snow mounds of Elmhurst, Illinois, to go to New York and work in the network television area of RCA, NBC, and that was wonderful. Lonesome George Go. Yeah, I remember that. I used to really like him. He was. He had a little girl on there. Uh, yes, I think, he did. Ah, yeah. uh, yes, he did. Uh, pretty Lord. perky Peggy King was it? Pretty perky Peggy King. <laughs> what a memory, David Thompson. <laughs> Wonderful. <laughs> perfect. And oddly enough, Peggy, Peggy King uh, had had a uh, contract with MGM, oh, the uh, right? girl singer. In fact, she sang, made a demo record of a song I wrote to see if we could sell to Decca Records. Is that right? Peggy King. Oh, yeah. Okay. And so... Okay, uh, so let me see how hired you to go to New York to... What were you going to do there then? I was going to be in the net, uh, uh, NBC Network television area. I don't know what it was going to be until I got there. And so I started there to work as a unit manager on any show that came along. The Saturday Night News up at 125th Street Studios, the uh, the big shows that we would do out of 8H, including uh, uh, the big musical shows. Well, okay, what's a what's a unit manager? Unit manager is the business manager of a television show. Oh, okay. He makes the arrangements for all of the accoutrement, all of the things necessary: the stage, the props, the the, the electricians, uh, the personnel, and so. I'd been doing this maybe about two or three months when when they assigned me to start working on the Steve Allen show, which was in Studio 3A in the RCA building. And I knew that studio because we had done Name That Tune and two or three other pop boiler half hour shows there. And so I guess we've been doing that about two or three months. 
And it was hard because we went on the air at 11.15 and got off the air live at 12 midnight. And so I would start driving home or taking the train home. At, at, I would try always to catch the 12.05 Express from Grand Central Station to Stamford, Connecticut. That was not always possible. So after two or three months, they called me up and said, we want to take the Steve Allen show from the local WNBT, it was called, station to the network. And we'd like you to stay with the show and be the NBC representative on the show because Steve Allen has a package. He sold a entertainment package to NBC, which was the producer, Billy Harbach, Otto Harbach's son, Dwight Hemian, the best musical director television ever saw, two writers, Herb Sargent and Stan Burns. Herb Sargent went on to do Saturday Night Live and a bunch of things like that. And I think, and maybe a couple of secretaries. Then the rest of the staff reported to me. That was my job, being the NBC guy. And I made the arrangements, made the, uh, the, the uh, negotiations with the labor unions. The IA International Alliance of Theater and Stage Employees, a fellow by the name of Solly Pernick, P-E-R-N-I-C-K. Let's back up a little bit. Sure. We were talking about how at a certain point in time in your career on Hollywood, po uh, politics started to play and the enormous part. Okay. And what was that? Let me tell you very specifically what it was. <clears throat> My mother's brother, of whom I've spoken before, Richard Eberland, was president of the Hearst Corporation and a very strong conservative type. Uh, he was on, would have been on Robert Taft's kitchen cabinet and worked closely with a, a, Mr. Hoover, Herbert Hoover, used to come to his uh, fishing lodge up in Canada at Murray Bay, the Mal Bay, and Puerto Pic up there. And so he was, a, as Mr. Hurst was, a strong Republican type. And I guess that's why when I was at MGM, I got sent out on those Nixon trips and what have you. I had written a story about the USS Missouri called The Big Mo. It was a 27-page screen treatment intended to lead, lead to the development of a script, a motion picture script about the Missouri. It was a this is 1951, 52. It had been at uh, at Korea and had been brought back out of mouth balls and gone as it did at the Gulf War a little for the last time. And so someone told me that I ought to have an agent. I didn't have an agent. And so I called a man that I was recommended to, the name of Red Hershon, H-E-R-S-H-O-N, and Red, and very red hair. So when we first worked together, he said, how's that, oh, this is difficult, that commie pinko boss of yours, Dory Sherry. Mr. Sherry was the executive producer at MGM, working under Mr. Mayor, but wanting to take over the studio. And his politics were extremely liberal, certainly more so than mine. And so, Mr. Sherry's nephew, his sister's son, was a guy named Edgar Small. I told Edgar Small what I have just reported here. And Edgar said, my God, Dory's got to know about that. That guy represents a lot of people who are working at the studio. And so a meeting was set up for Dory Sherry's beautiful house up in Bel Air for Sunday morning at 11 o'clock of that week. I told him the story exactly as I've said it to you. And he said, why that so-and-so or something. In the middle of the week, office at MGM in the, uh, in the executive building. And when I walked in there was Paul Small, Edgar's adoptive father. Edgar Small's adoptive father. He changed his name to Small. And Red Hershon and his 
partner. And so we went over the story, I went over the story again, and Red Hershon said, what else would you expect from a dirty, rotten, Catholic son of a bitch? And he denied everything about it. And to make a long story short, as unpleasant as it was, it probably worked out for the best, I got fired about four days after that, maybe the next Monday. Because the feeling was that whether the story was true or not, and nobody except Red Hershon ever said it wasn't true, the difficulties that could be caused, because stories like that in Hollywood get out on the street awfully quickly. You don't have to say a word and it's out there. And that my uncles, oh, and Mr. Sherry was just being successful in deposing disposing of Mr. Mayor. Mr. Mayor got retired and by Joe Sch by Nicholas Schenk, the head of Lowe's Incorporated that owned MGM. And so Edgar Small called me and said, my God, what, what did we do? And I said, I'm sure your uncle just felt it was the easiest thing rather than a fight with a guy who was a skunk like uh, Red Hershon. Uh, get rid of the kid. So, fortunately, that was the weekend that Baron Hilton and I were putting together our plan to put the, the Hilton Hotels on television. And so we took that plan maybe a week or ten days later to Mr. Hilton, Sr. That was a lovely idea and I got hired to go to Chicago. Yeah. Everything seems to work for the best. Right? Yeah, I think so. Okay, so back in uh, back in New York now. And again, back in New York now, working on Steve the Tonight, Allen. Steve Allen, the Tonight Show. They had checked, called it Tonight Show by the time. Yeah, we started on September 27th, 1954. And uh, I had had to go down to the Hudson Theater on 44th Street with a big back door, a scenery door that opened on 45th Street, and depose Kate Smith, the loved Kate Smith out of her theater, and her companion, Ted, whose name I'll remember someday again now, just exploded. With you had to do what now? Throw them out of the theater so we could use the theater. They used the theater five afternoons a week for a half hour Kate Smith show oh. on NBC. And we were going to be there from uh, 11, 15 at night to 1 a.m. So we had rehearsals and scenery to load in and props and what have you. So they told, "What? I will never. I guess I guess it's easier to have me go do it rather than have the head of the studio, head of the of NBC, tell Miss Smith and Ted, what's his name, that they couldn't work out of that theater." And what it turned out to be was the demise of the. Kate Smith show, on television anyway, as far as I know. And so we started down there, we rehearsed, we took out eight rows of seats, oh, pardon me, we took out a orchestra pit and put seats in right down close, except where three cameras went. Steve liked to work right to people as close as possible, comics, and they'd like to do that. <clears throat> so we started at uh, we were doing a thing called the Father Knickerbocker Show. It was a beer in New York. And uh, we had a 15-minute show every evening, five evenings a week for Father Knickerbocker. Then at 11.30, we went on the network. That was when they first had the coaxial cable. Can we break for a minute? I'm going to have to get a little bit of water. Sure, that's <laughs> fine. As long as Steve Allen. Wonderfully. It was a great place to work. It was more fun. And somewhat the interesting thing about it was was getting through work at 1 a.m. Because then I would drive our Plymouth station wagon back to Pound Ridge, New York, 
which was 52 miles. And uh, only one night do I remember falling asleep and almost going into a bridge abutment in Greenwich, Connecticut. I didn't. Uh, we traveled the show a lot, and then in 1955, just when my fourth son Ted was being born, uh, Steve had been hired by Universal International Pictures to play Benny Goodman in the Benny Goodman story. And so the show was going to work out of the uh, Hollywood studios of NBC. <clears throat> that was before they moved to Burbank. And uh, so I went out, I guess, oh, two or three weeks early for a week or ten days to set it all up, to get our studio set and how we would work it. Uh, Where was the studio then? It was at uh, Hollywood and, uh, and Sunset, Sunset and Hollywood Boulevard. Or be actually between Sunset and Hollywood Boulevard on uh, Vine Street, Hollywood Vine. Uh, and so then Teddy was born on June <coughs> 15th, 1955, and we started the show on June 18th, 1955. So I had to leave and uh, got a driver to take Marna home. What a person she is. Anyway, so we worked out of Hollywood for about, gee, I was there for a month or two. She came out once, and we came out to Palm Springs, in fact, and spent uh, three or four days at the lovely hotel in my back <clears throat> But then the push to color television was very much in vogue at NBC, as well as the other networks, but primarily at NBC, yeah, the first ones, yeah. because RCA yeah. wanted to sell color television sets. And so they, was the first one. There you go. Ever. Exactly. So we would color up, so they took me out of The Tonight Show, which was about time, and made me executive producer of, of a color unit at NBC Network. <clears throat> and we would, as they called it, color up a different show every week. Uh, and then we also had... Uh, and this was in New York? In New home. York. In New York. And we also had a, uh, a uh, daily show called Matinee Theater, which a very famous Broadway producer was doing, and I can't remember his name. I could see his face, but I can't remember his name. And uh, so every week we would work on a different show. And so then finally what happened, interestingly enough, General Sarnoff decided that we should try to get into soft goods. We should try to get the, the uh, various major, um, I guess you'd call them chains, but maybe not. Uh, they were the big department stores to get them into local color television to show their finery, their women's clothes, their men's clothes, their sporting goods, uh, their china, their uh, linens and what have you. And so we did the first of, as Variety called it in a review, the first of the of the hard sale spectaculars. We did this show <coughs> to show how color television, but, and we broadcast it to 97, uh, pardon me, we closed circuit and broadcast it by the telephone company, by closed circuit, never went out over the air, to 97 different markets where all the top buyers and, and managers of the major department stores and specialty stores were invited to a luncheon to see this particular show. Well, we had this crazy idea. We got supposedly the eight most beautiful models in New York. And we dressed them first in lingerie and then dressed them from the bottom up, you might say. Well, I tell you, this cost. <laughs> because local television reviewers would be invited to this by the local station, which was closed circuit, and they had an absolute that they had a ball with it. It was a celebration. It was written up all over the country. So all of a sudden, I find myself 
at NBC, very happy with everything, the way everything's going, but getting offers from advertising agencies to come work at their advertising agency and run their television departments or be part of their television department. The reason I accepted one of those jobs at Kenyon Eckhart Advertising was that I never got home. I had now four boys, Michael, Richard, Timothy, and Ted, and I was never there. I was traveling around the country doing television shows. I was up till all hours of the night staying in the city in hotels because I was working till 10, 11, 12 at night. And it just seemed to me that uh, if you're going to have those wonderful children, you you have that certain specific duty to s pay a little attention. It's not good enough to be there Saturday and maybe go to their baseball game or something, or a swimming meet. So I accepted this position at a nice increase in salary, which helped us, at uh, Kenyon Eckhart Advertising, a large advertising agency at 247 Park Avenue. And started, it's appeared, to have a nine to five existence for almost the first time in our... What was the name of it again? Kenyon, K-E-N-Y-O-N, the ampersand sign, and Eckhart, E-C-K-H-A-R-D-T, Kenyon Eckhart Advertising. It has long since swallowed up by some huge advertising Goliath, a conglomerate of some sort. Uh, and was there for, my goodness, since 1956 to 1970, for 15 years, for almost 15 years. Reacquainted myself with Joan Crawford, who was the wife of Al Steele, who was the president of Pepsi-Cola, one of our clients. And, uh, Once or twice at Christmas time after Al died, she would have me to lunch at 21 and give me from 5 to 10 or something envelopes. These are people in trouble. I want you to give them, go give them this money. Don't tell them where it came from. Amazing. A lot of money, too, not $50, $500, $700, $1,000. Once she sent me to Hollywood. Fortunately, I was going out to Los Angeles anyway. This Thanksgiving and Christmas. She, how often would she do this, did you say? She did it two years and missed a year, then did it another year, three years out of four. And uh, there was a, a, a still photographer that worked for Photoplay Magazine, whom I knew well from my days at MGM, by the name of Jaime Fink. That's H-Y-M-I-E, Fink as in Fink, if I can get it's Jaime's in Mount Sinai House. That's before it was Cedar Sinai. It's in Mount Sinai Hospital, and he's dying. And he needs everything, but the only thing we can give him is a little bit of money. So I took this nice Joan Crawford pink envelope without her name on it. And I don't know how much was in it, but it was a big, thick envelope. It must have been a couple thousand dollars. And took it to Jaime Fink in the hospital up on or Santa Monica in Hollywood. And uh, he cried when he opened this. <clears throat> His wife came in just before I left and he died the next day. So mm -hmm. she helped him. And she was a terrific lady, an unusual woman. Particularly vitriolic about some things, but people she liked, she liked very much. She was very dear to Mike to Marna. And, uh, the uh, envelopes would they be for? Did she know who? People she, she knew. She, okay. And she had written their names on the front of each envelope. So I am sure. I, I think she wrote them, or her secretary did, or something. So I'm sure the people who got them knew pretty much. But I never told any person where they came from. This is from a friend of yours who wanted you to have it. Two of them were ladies, two sisters, who lived at the uh, at the motion picture relief home out in the valley. And I don't know what their 
problem was the Nielsen, Nielsen, N I L S S O N with their names. It's not important. And but how terrific. If you can do that, to do it is wonderful. And I think perhaps that was not the reputation which preceded her through her later years. Because there were reports, of course, that she was a real terror in the in, in, in the Pepsi Cola boardroom <clears throat> because she tried to take over when Al died. And I don't think she did, but I knew the guys that did, her Barnett and Bill Durkee, what have you. But she gave them a run for their money. In fact, she asked me to help her. Uh, she had four adopted children, which started when she was married to French Oton, and then went on. Who knows? And so, her eldest daughter was named Christina, and she was rather a large girl. And so, Joan and Al had me to lunch someplace. Who knows? Maybe twenty-one. That was their favorite place. And so. Do you think you could help Christina get a part in some small off-Broadway or some small theatrical operation? We don't want to do it because it looks so patently phony if we just force it in some way. And I said, well, I'll try. I don't know a lot of theatrical things. She said, of course you do. She named some people who did know in the theatrical business. <laughs> And so I went around, I can't remember exactly what happened, but sure enough, about a month later, or maybe more, I got her a part in a show called The Night Before Twelfth Night. Now, I don't know what that means. This is the girl who wrote yeah, Mommy years. Dearest, okay? And so that was advertised that it was going to be, and then they changed the name to the to something. But it was opening in the 100, I don't know, the 92nd Street Y, which had a stage in that little theater for about two or 300 people, up at 92nd and Lex in Manhattan. And I guarantee you, the ceiling was no higher than the top of that thing there. That thing. It wasn't more than eight, I think I got it. Was it hot? This was a June night and no air conditioning. So we showed up there and I went with the Steels and their big Cadillac chauffeur to the park there. Some way, probably Jones doing, the local press had gotten word of this and there were five or six photographers there and what have you. Well, Christina did this part and I think it was probably okay the way she did it. The, it was an in, incredible physical challenge working in this crummy YMCA. I don't know. But afterwards, Joan said, Now you watch her. Are you going to go see it every night? And I said, Probably not, Joan. Do you want somebody to check on her tonight? Well, yes, I do. I said, what do you mean to check on it? Well, make sure she remembers her line. I said, well, that's, that's not part of the package. She remembers her line. She knows her part. And then we went someplace for a late supper. And Christina came in. And Joan immediately said, you've got to take off some weight. Oh yes, when I left there it was raining and I couldn't get a cab to get down to Grand Central Station. It's now 11 o'clock or something. God, I got soaked. That's all I remember about it. But I didn't go to the show anymore. And she did get another job in some other place, someplace. And I don't know whether she took off any weight or not. But it was certainly not. And then the boy, the, the boy called me son of Joan Crawford. Well, I'm sorry, I'm kind of missing it. Could you get me a job? And 
something. It wasn't in the theater or anything. He said, get me a job. He was 17 or 18. He said, I've got to get out of this house. So then what Joan did was she created a, uh, at 426 North, something, the name of the street in Beverly again, Santa Monica, Brentwood that I will remember. She had this lovely white colonial house, swimming pool. So when she would be in New York with Al Steele running the Pepsi Cola Company, these kids would be pretty much on their own with some kind of a nanny or a house maid or something. So I went out there one afternoon. I was out here for a trip, and my God, you should have seen that. There were individuals without their, all their clothes on and everything else, so I, oh boy. So I called Joan when I got back to the hotel. I was staying up in the, in the Bel Air Hotel, in one of those little rooms by the parking lot, so you could park in the parking lot to go through that whole routine at the lobby and everything else. And I called her and told her, she said, well, I thought something funny was going on. I'll be out tomorrow and I'll take care of it. So I didn't hear any more. And then didn't have any more to do with her until after Al still died and the money sent to various people. Mm -hmm. And then, so I stayed at, M at uh, Kenyon Eckhart. And, uh, <clears throat> Did you read Mommy Dearest? Did you, did you read that book? I read most of it and then went saw the film with Mrs. Smith, with Tall Girl. Did any of it ring true? Sure. The shouting. Yeah, you know, craziness. I mean, uh, I must say that uh, in a de facto manner, she had a she had a right because they were really wild. But how how unwild can you be with that kind of a of a uh, atmosphere? You know. So did you retire from? Uh, no, I went from Kenya in that guard to start my own magazine. I wanted to start a magazine because there was a, a, a term becoming current in the early 70s called lifestyles. And lifestyle this and lifestyle that. So I started Lifestyle Magazine and got Bankers Trust to give me a few hundred thousand dollars to start this thing. We were doing pretty well. It was going to be a controlled circulation magazine, which means that we selected the audience by a research project, which was very expensive, and they didn't have to subscribe to it. We sent it to them, thinking that they would be a very desirable audience for the advertiser, and they proved to be. And so we got about 300,000 in other words, in days like that, Time Magazine probably had a median income of their subscriber or reader of about 13000 We had a median income of 29000 Big spenders, supposedly, in those days. I mean, that would get you a gas station job today, but, you know. Um, a me, um, right there, median income. Half of them are over 29000 and half of them are below. Of the people that you sent to the people that sent the magazine to, no. correct. Yeah. Control circulation. And <clears throat> 1970, and our first, sorry, that late 70, early 71, first issue came out in February of 1972 and was really doing pretty darn well. Got a lot of advertising and then something called the recession of 1972. 73 hit, not to mention the oil and barco and the what have you, and people just stopped advertising except in those specific media that they knew pointed directly to their customers. And so we went out of business and about a year later, unfortunately, and I was hired by, my uncle had long since left the business, uh, at uh, the Hearst Magazine, Vice President of Marketing for the Hearst magazines. And my job was to bring new clients in to the ICD, International Circulation Distributors. That was the um, newsstand arm of the Hearst magazines. They handled, oh, maybe 100, 150 magazines, not just their own, 
good housekeeping, cosmopolitan town and country, what have you, but then a bunch of other magazines for other publishers. And so I was able, over a period of a few months, to bring in the CBS publications. That was 35 magazines and a whole line of paperback books called Popular Library, who had a very large business in paperbacks, paperback books. And so I did that for about two or three years, I guess, until 1946, until uh, 1976, when I had lunch one day with Bill Davis, the man who started the Golf Digest magazine, and uh, which, oddly enough, just this past week was bought by Advanced Publications. And so Bill said, what are you doing? And I said, I'm kind of lollygagging around. I'm not doing much. And he said, Would you, I'm going to start some golf schools, or golf digest golf schools. Would you help me get them going? I said, that just sounds like great fun. Can I get paid doing it too? He said, sure, sure. What were you making your last place? And I told him, he said, you can have that. So I started to do that. Had you played much golf? Yeah, I had played golf in, in high school and was on the college golf team for 15 minutes till the war started. Then they stopped letting us drive up to the Berkeley Country Club to play, which was right. Yeah. And uh, they had no way to mow the thing. And uh, so I went to work for Bill Davis and Golf Digest, and we did 13 schools that first year. This year they're going to do 1,600. Schools. Is that amazing? You look at a, a week, look at 52 weeks in a year, that means there, there are like 25 or 30 golf schools every week. It's amazing. They're everywhere. Yeah. So anyway, that was great. So then I started a division of Golf Dice, and they also owned Tennis Magazine, and uh, which was so earlier. Very good. that we started a thing called Golf GDT Sports, Golf Digest Tennis Sports. What it was was a promotion company to do to run tournaments for sponsors, to put together packages of, of travel and, and golf and tennis schools. And I branched immediately into the network. I got Tony Trabert, a good friend of mine and a guy I might admire enormously, but a superb guy, to do a series of, of uh, tennis instruction tapes uh, that I put on NBC in their coverage of tennis tournaments uh, and uh, sold to Payne Weber. The, uh, Donald Marin was a big tennis aficionado and he was the chairman of it, still is, of Payne Weber. And then I got Bob Toski, who was the number one coach, T-O-S-K-I, at Golf Digest schools and did the same thing with him, the sold NBC to go in their golf instruction, also sponsored by Payne Weber. So that stuff just worked great and we made a lot of money on it and everybody liked them and it just sounded terrific and I was talking about television and this, television and that. And so the, the executive vice president of the New York Times Company, which owned Golf Digest and Tennis, a charming man by the name of Sidney, S-Y-D-N-E-Y, Grusin, G-R-U-S-O-N, had me to lunch in the executive dining room of the New York Times at 229 West 43rd Street in Manhattan. And they're talking, there are a couple other people there, one guy I knew, one guy I didn't know, and talking, talking. And uh, so dessert came or something, or coffee, and he said, you must be wondering what this is all about. And I said, well, I'm 
not generally so rude as to demand a reason for a great lunch like this. Why don't we do it again tomorrow? And you tell me then. Uh, that's typical for smart Alec. He said, well, we have decided to try to go into television. We own five stations, five television stations, and big markets, good, good stations. We own uh, a number of radio stations, and plus WQXR, the, the, uh, the big good music station in New York. <clears throat> and we think maybe you're the guy that can get this done. That sounds interesting. Why don't you tell me once again what you want done? Do you want the editorial material from the newspapers? They also own 26 newspapers in addition to the New York Times. The editorial material translated into television. And he said, well, what do you think we should do? I said, boy, that's certainly an open sesame. Be careful, Sydney, with me. Don't ever give me a straight line like that. You'll be, you'll be in trouble. And to cut through a lot of persiflage, what have you, they were in trouble at that, because I had some pretty big ideas about how this, the brilliance of the New York Times editorial material could be translated into television. We had, for example, I think it was 26 or 34, and I don't remember the name, bureaus in capitals around the world with very able guys or girls doing this work. And so my first thought came about through an accident. The NA National Association, it's called NATPE, N-A-T-P-E, National Association of Television Program Executives, NATPE was having its meeting in Las Vegas at the Hilton. And so I went out there to go to that thing. And on the floor over in one of these booths and places was a little R2-D2 kind of a robot. And it rolled up to you and said, Hi, who are you? And I you know, he said, Oh, hi, hi. He said, I said, who do you work for? And it was right on his darn things, cable news network. And I wasn't, I had an idea what that was, I wasn't sure. And he said, I said, oh, you work for Ted Turner. <gasps> you said it, you said it. And I said, is Mr. Turner here? And this was some voice over in a, in a, in a, in their booth. Yeah, he's here. I said, I'd certainly like to meet him. So I went over and had a meeting with Ted Turner in which I knew enough about Cable News Network. I just didn't know what their international plan was. We knew that they had WTBS in Atlanta and some station pick up affiliates around the country. And so <clears throat> I suggested to Mr. Hearn, he might be interested in talking to us with our 34 bureaus, all capably uh, in the hands of top journalists. He said, my God, that, that sounds like what I'm trying to put together. Well, I, you, you can guess, the, the, this guy is, is, is electric. He gets so enthusiastic about something, his enthusiasm just carries everybody with it. You just can't not think, boy, that's going to happen. That's going to be great. And uh, so, more than anything else, he said, I'd love to have a proposal from you. How did it work? Well, make a long story short, I got back to New York and uh, started to write this proposal. And my boss said, you better clear that. What are you going to do with that? And I said, I'm going to talk to Sydney about it, the executive vice president. And then the bunch, Salzberger, who was my friend, uh, who hadn't, didn't even know I was working at Gulf Digest, so I'd been there for three months. Uh, and see if we can't put some kind of deal together. He said, you better check that out with Abe Rosenthal. Abe Rosenthal was the executive editor of the New York Times. Well, that was the first
first, third, fifth, and twenty-eighth last thing in the world that Abe Rosenthal wanted to do. He said, what? Have Craig with me in London? On some cable television show? Where where does our reputation go? Drizzle down the tubes. You put our people on a on cable television? Gee whiz. Remember, this is nineteen eighty. It is nineteen eighty, exactly. And he said, You must be what are you trying to do? You trying to to wreck our business? And I said, uh, well, uh, actually, you have the best uh, field force in the world in news, much better than the Associated Press. Associated Press is just a newspaper who is, a, as you know, or a TV station is a member of the Associated Press, and they some kind sometimes file their stories through AP. And I said, AP's doing nothing in television, and you can take it over from the news standpoint. Not as long as I'm on the face of the earth, he said. So I went to, uh, occasionally, quite occasionally, frequently, if I even say, Martin and I would go up on Saturday night up the hill from where we lived in Stanford, Connecticut, uh, to uh, Arthur and Carol Salzberger's house. He was the chairman of the New York Times Company and the publisher. And we had been friends for, oh, 15 years. And when he found out that I was working at Golf Digest, one night he, we were up there, sorry, and he said, well, I just got some great news that a great old friend of mine has stabbed me in the back. And I said, yeah, who did that? I'll kill him. And he looked at me and he said, I don't think you will. Well, you know, it's, the Catholics don't allow suicide. And I said, what are you talking about? Why didn't you tell me you were going to golf that? I said, it would, it would intrude on your role as chief executive of this business. You should, they, they knew that I knew you, but didn't know that our, our close personal relationship had been going for 15 years, and it's just better that you didn't know. He said, well, that's for you to say, and for me to question. I, that was a dumb decision. Now I look like a, I said, anybody who thinks you're a fool, fire them. Well, that, yeah, that's not a bad idea. <laughs> so it all washed down the line. So I went to see Punch uh, Salberger about uh, about doing uh, about my talk with uh, Abe Rosenthal, and he sat down. And he had a little teeny office, certainly no bigger than two thirds of this, up on the 14th floor of the New York Times building. He said, well, he said, I've heard a little bit about this. I heard that he was ranting and raving after you left. And I said, well, he said, there's one thing I can't afford as head of this business. He said, that chair you're sitting in, he said, see the chair right next to you? I can't have Abe Rosenthal, my executive editor for the last 14 years, sitting there and you sitting there and him saying, either he goes or I go. He said, I'm not prepared for Abe Rosenthal to leave this business yet. It'll be another couple of years when I'll replace him and make him into a columnist, which he did. So he said, just pull back from that, just keep doing what you're doing and get done what you can get done. It was a disappointment because I just, I could just see our guy from Tehran reporting on, and remember, there weren't that many cable systems out there. I don't think there were three or four hundred cable systems out there at the time, and they were tiny. The one in Stanford, Connecticut, only had 2,000 sign-ups. So uh, that went the way of all flesh, and certainly CNN has done a brilliant a job in their uh, coverage of the news worldwide, and they are a staple now. And of course, MSNBC and Fox coming along strongly with their thing. They're the fastest growing of the cable news networks and CNBC with their uh, more or less their uh, uh, focus on uh, institutional and financial news. But so we did uh, <clears throat> that and I stayed at uh, 
at uh, the New York Times Company until I retired on May 1st of 1989. We worked, we did a, a special on the Science Times called Search about amazing scientific things. I did that with Warner Brothers. I did a series of home video operations for uh, uh, with Craig Claiborne, who was the food writer for the New York Times. Uh, some of our, our people at the, at the Family Circle, uh, the women's magazine, the biggest in the world at that time. A number of other uh, television uh, operations, mostly around the magazine division, more than the newspapers, so as you can understand. And uh, just most wonderful company to work for in the world. You know, that was an amazing company. And I retired from there May 1st, uh, 1989. Um, when you were doing those golf digests, did, you came out here probably for the desert, didn't we you? We did. We did the first one at Ironwood. When it only had 27 holes, in the, uh, 18 holes, and they were building the 27th hole, 27 holes, and now they have 18 up there. It's wonderful. Yes. We did it there, and then we did them in Florida at Boca Raton, and we did them at uh, did the tennis things at Greenleaf in uh, near Tampa, Florida, with uh, Tony Travert, and uh, it just kept going on. It was an amazing business, you know. Right. People buy that stuff, and uh, yeah, that's good. yeah, because they had had them over at Mission Hills to yes. the Weston. Yep, and sure. They, yeah, PJ West, I believe. Yeah. I think so. Yeah. Oh, yes. I've had the had the golf school everywhere, and uh, they have all women's golf school, all juniors. Guys, sent my number five boy Christopher to the first junior school with Davis Love's father. Davis Love uh, right. Junior uh, was the head instructor before, uh -huh. and uh, Christopher plays very well to this day. So, uh, it's just terrific business. So, what did you do when you retired then? We. Uh, talked about it. I, I was out here, Marta was out here working on a project called called Publishers That's, you kill me if you found out, I forgot the name of this thing. It was a, she would read maybe two dozen, three dozen international and national uh, and magazines and newspapers a week, and she would call from them good ideas for TV shows or movies, and they would be uh, produced on, oh, Publishers Audio Review, P-A-R, Publishers Audio Review. They would be produced on audio tape by a a uh, guy with a wonderful voice from the Disney studio who did a lot of work, uh, uh, voiceover stuff at Disney. And then we sent out a very nice uh, document to try to sell this. So the first time there, I think there were five or ten that them sold, it was $500 a year, and they got one every month. So she was out here working on that, and I came out to see her. And I went home to Westport, Connecticut. We moved out of our huge stone house on Schofield Down Road into a condo up in Westport, Connecticut. Fancy, fancy place. And I went to my usual 559 train down at the Westport station. Nobody else. Ice that thick on the, on the station platform. As I stood there in my overcoat with my muffler and a hat. Huge snowflakes this size, gorgeous. And I watched that come down. And as they said in the network, that movie network, I'm mad as hell and I'm not going to take it anymore. I picked up my briefcase, had my New York Times, went home, got in bed, and stayed there all day reading books and my newspaper, and called the president of the company, Walter Matson. I wonder if we could have lunch someday this week. And he said, you name it, I'm free. And we did the next day, and we had a three-hour lunch, in which I think I negotiated, or he very kindly allowed me to get what I call a, not a golden parachute, but a golden hang glider. It just goes on and on and on. And if I kick tomorrow, Marta gets the same thing forever. 
And so that was February 1989, and on May 1st, 1989, we had a wonderful party at 21 up in the apartment for about 30 or 40, 50 people. It was gorgeous, and everybody said the right thing, and I cried bitter tears that I hadn't done a better job, and everybody said, no, no, you did If Abe would have let you, you could have done a great job. And uh, we sold our, I did a, a smart thing for once in my life. I had people looking at our condo, when I was still out here. And so each time somebody would come in, I would, I'm a baker, I like to bake things. So I'd put, I'd bake fresh rolls, and they'd be in just out of the oven. And that, that scent throughout a house just kills people. So a lady whose husband was ill bought our house at our, our condo at our price. And I got on the airplane and came to Los Angeles. And my Los Angeles children led me out to the parking lot at uh, LAX. And I said, well, that's fine, we can do that, but then you got to take me by the uh, the rental place. I've got a Davis car waiting for me. He said, no, you don't. No. I said, well, yeah. yes, I do, because your mother's got this crummy little car out here. I bought her a Hyundai, Hyundai or something, a little blue thing. And uh, they showed me this beautiful big black see the hand that they bought me. It's my going away present. How nice. So it has just been, you know, and so the past, coming up on the on the uh, 12th year, on May 1st, I mean, how the good Lord has been paying assiduous attention and not deserved. Uh, did you buy a place right away, or had you been, had a place we, coming out? No, or? we didn't. We, we, we came out and looked. My friend from college, Bill Pennington, who owned Circus Circus, 50% Circus Circus. And Forbes claims he has $750 million. He never gave me any, but we see each other occasionally. Uh, he took us around and we looked at every place. We looked at, uh, we looked over at, uh, at the Desert Horizon. Uh, I couldn't afford the Morningside, which was just kind of starting then. It was too expensive for what we could get. And uh, we looked uh, literally everywhere. And Bill said, well, you know, he said, I belong, have a desert membership of something called the PGA West, and I can play all the desert courses that they own. He said, that's landmark land company. And so we came out and we bought a condo on, on Tanglewood there, and uh, we moved out there in September of 89. We took an apartment in, on uh, 4th Street. Down on 7th Street, across from down from Vons, down from Pavilions in uh, Santa Monica for the summer, and saw a lot of our children and our just starting up group of grandchildren. There were just only one or two were born at that time, and uh, and there you are. And so you've got how many children then? We have six children, six five nine, boys, nine. and Sarah Patience Harvard. Mine always kids me when I say the only perfect person other than the Virgin Mary ever placed on the face of the earth. Sarah's darling. And then we have 12 grandchildren. We have four boys and eight girls. And they are just nifty. And uh, yeah, uh, what you eight and four? Eight, eight, eight girls, four boys. Michael, the eldest, and I said earlier was 54, is uh, has a writing contract at the Turner Network Television, TNT. Been working with uh, Big Pelleggi, the guy who wrote Goodfellas and those various things, and Get Shorty or whatever it was. And uh, the, the number two boy is Richard. He is the copy chief for Ziff Davis in Manhattan. They're a big magazine publishing outfit. Number three boy, Timothy, uh, will be 50 on March 18th. He is the president and chief officer of. State Street Global Advisors, an enormous worldwide banking firm. He is some piece of work, let me tell you. Ted is will be 46 this June 15th, uh, is president of NBC Studios out in Burbank. He used to be chairman of ABC and got out there to work, went to work with David. Uh, what's it? David, not David Spielberg. Steven. Steven. 
Steve Steven Spielberg. No. And he made some TV shows for them, and then NBC came to get him. And the number, and Sarah is married to Sean Mahoney. They live in Tigard, Oregon, T-I-G-A-R-D, Oregon. And uh, Christopher is a partner in the very, very large, probably the third largest agency in the world called uh, United Talent Agency. There's CAA and William Morris and UTA. And he, he's the guy who put together the package for Sopranos. I don't know whether you'll ever see it. I find it that just... Uh, I'm not, no, I'm not. I've heard a lot about it, though. Filthy. I mean, it's just, it's just so, so, the language is what it yeah, that's what offends. I uh, what does he do? What does he do there? He's an agent. He's head of the TV department for uh, for UTA on Wilshire Boulevard, and so uh, right. They've all done well. That's for sure. They're a pretty wonderful group, and they seem to like us, or at least tolerate us. And, and, and what do you do for? Uh, I uh, lollygag, and I do the work on the computer. I finally got DAV instead of DAY. <laughs> I don't know how the hell I did that, but I. Uh, and, uh, and I work with the PGA West Members Association. I'm an advisor to that group, and I write and produce their newsletter. And, uh, which I sent you one of a, few, a couple of years ago. Yeah, I think so. Oh, for admission notes. And, uh, and I, uh... You're a member of the Air Museum? I'm going to be a little more active. I've got to find some way to be prolific in helping, not just in this fun <laughs> trick of talking about yourself, but uh, something. Well, um, maybe. You play golf? Not I do. I play golf at PGA West. Not as well as I once did. In, in 1995, I had an automobile accident. The lady hit me oh. on Avenue 52 and Calhoun Street going 70 miles an hour. Hit me on the right rear of my brand new <laughs> Ford Explorer, which I just love. And as I rolled over twice, they said I went over twice, they showed me, I hit my hand, right hand on the rear view mirror. And that right hand and wrist has been a, uh, and, and the nice doctors up at, up at DOC, like Doc Steve O'Connell, they're yeah, a great guy, said, well, yeah. Ted. Yeah. <laughs> I said, is there anything that put me in sleep and open it up and fix it? He said, no. <laughs> no. <laughs> Exercise so you can at least hold the club. So it's been a little bit of an intrusion on it, but that's yeah. all right. Yeah. And we do, you know, we have the, the wonderful free ride the imagination gets uh, as you get older and a coterie of, of friends whom you never knew before in your life. You never knew you needed them as friends until all of a sudden at 77 and 78. There they are, and wonderful, and warm, and intrigued a little bit because out of the very successful people with whom we travel there, nobody ever saved Elizabeth Taylor from her father beating her. So it's a, a flavor of a, of a different sort. And so, well, that is never... Uh, more than once the topic of conversation. There is that kind of a free spirit. Martin and I have lived a different kind of life than most of them have in, in Seattle and Moses Lake, Washington and Texas and what have you. So it's kind of fun. And then they too, they love our children when they come out because the boys are sometimes closer to their, much closer to their age than, than, to my, than, than I am to their age. And so it works out awfully nicely. Ted, thank you so much. Thank you, David Thompson. Really enjoyed Such it. Such a pleasure to even get to know you better. And would you like me to do something with these? May I leave these with you? Yes, would you please? I would, I'd love to do that. Wonderful. And, uh, and if there is... I'll go, I'm sure there will be, and then I'll want to get together with you, so...